Prime Minister fights for survival as more Conservative MPs openly call for her to go. In the last hour, the most senior Conservative backbencher, Sir Graham Brady, has been seen walking into Downing Street to meet the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister invited Sir Graham in to judge the mood in her party. This afternoon it's bleak and there are an increasing number of MPs saying Liz Truss has to go. One Tory MP has said Liz Truss only has hours left to stabilise her government and even a cabinet minister could not say categorically that she will lead her party into the next election. That's what we will be working towards and we hope that we will uh, be able to do that uh, whilst delivering so that the British you people hope. understand exactly why uh, it's important uh, to support the Conservative agenda. You hope, but you don't believe. Uh, I'm a politician. I'm all about delivery. Who the knows? Have it! The knows! Have it! Last night, the Prime Minister faced an open revolt by some of her own MPs in the Commons and there were claims that several were bullied and manhandled in the lobbies by ministers. This cannot continue. Britain deserves better. Britain cannot afford the chaos of the Conservatives anymore. We need a general election now. Well, at the last count, 13 Conservative MPs have now openly called for Liz Truss to stand down. Uh, one says that her position is now untenable. Also this lunchtime. The long-awaited inquiry into child sex abuse says failing to report it should be against the law. It's not perfect, but it is better if government has the guts to make it law. If it had been in place when I was a school child, then the abuse that, that we suffered might not have happened. A warning today that the decline in the traditional relationship between family doctors and their patients in England could put people's safety at risk. And an early painting of the Beatles that may have inspired the Sgt Pepper album cover is going up for auction. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, Manchester United's Ronaldo will be spoken to today by manager Eric Ten Hag after the striker left Old Trafford before full time last night. Hello, good afternoon. The Prime Minister is fighting for her political survival after a chaotic 24 hours which saw her Home Secretary resign and an open revolt in the House of Commons. One Tory MP says Liz Truss now has only a matter of hours to stabilise her government. Last night, ministers were accused of manhandling and bullying colleagues to make them support the government in a key vote on fracking. Well, let's just show you the scene live now in Downing Street right now, where in the last hour, the Prime Minister has been meeting the most senior Conservative backbencher, Sir Graham Brady, the influential chairman of the 1922 committee. Now, the BBC understands it is a meeting that Liz Truss has requested. Let's get the latest from our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake at Westminster. Calm on the outside at least in Downing Street this morning after a day of drama that showed a government struggling to function. The minister in charge of party discipline went into number 10 first thing. For a while last night, it wasn't clear whether she was still in the job. Have you lost control, Chief Whip? The Chancellor was in a hurry to get to work too, with no answer to the question many are asking. Has the PM lost control? Questions for the Cabinet over Liz Truss's future and their own. Good morning. Are you planning to resign? No. <laughs> Is the government fully really functioning? Well, it's quite clear that they're quite, there's quite a lot of turmoil in the party, but what we all need to do is keep calm heads and work to resolve it, and I'm confident that we can do that. And not exactly a resounding yes from one senior minister when asked... Do you believe that she will definitely lead you into the next general election? Uh, that's what we will be working towards, and we hope that we will uh, be able to do that uh, whilst delivering so that the British you people hope. understand exactly why uh, it's important uh, to support the Conservative agenda. You hope, but you don't believe... Uh, I'm a politician. I'm all about delivery. How long can the Prime Minister last? Yesterday, Suella Braverman quit as Home Secretary, saying she had concerns about the future of the government and pointedly suggesting the Prime Minister should take responsibility for her mistakes. 
Enter Grant Shapps at the Home Office, a critic of Liz Truss who backed her rival Rishi Sunak for leader. Division! Clear the lobby! The government's day got worse in Parliament, with confusion over whether a vote on fracking was being treated as a test of confidence in the government. A Labour MP claimed he saw Conservatives being bullied and manhandled into backing Liz Truss, all of it leaving Tory backbenchers in despair. This is an absolute disgrace. As a Tory MP of 17 years, who's never been a minister, who's got on with it loyally most of the time, I think it's a shambles and a disgrace. I think it is utterly appalling. More than a dozen Conservative MPs have now said the Prime Minister should go. For others, her time is running out. I think it seems as though her position is untenable now. But, you know, let's see what today holds. But from my point of view, it does seem like the confidence of MPs has, has been lost. And I don't, I don't know how that would come back, really. You know, last night's scenes were very distressing, humiliating in some ways. And the number one job of government is to get MPs through the lobby, to get government business through. And that clearly was, was very difficult last night. But Labour say enough is enough. In a speech to trade unions this morning, Sir Keir Starmer was scathing. This cannot continue. Britain deserves better. Britain cannot afford the chaos of the Conservatives anymore. We need a general election now. Into the back door of Downing Street earlier, Sir Graham Brady, the MP who'll know better than any how much support the Prime Minister has left. Jonathan Blake, BBC News, Westminster. And live now to our chief political correspondent, Nick Early, who's in Downing Street with the very latest from there, because Sir Graham Brady is very, very important because he's a man who can make or break prime ministers. He is, Ben, and it's his counsel that often leads to prime ministers knowing when the game is up. The Prime Minister asked for this meeting. We're told that she wanted to judge the mood of her party. But when Graham Brady's in there, I suspect he'll be telling her that the mood of the Conservative Party this afternoon is, is dire, quite frankly. There are no shortage of Tory MPs wandering around Parliament this morning with their head in their hands, absolutely um, terrified of what's going on in to the party, but also absolutely furious at what went on in Parliament yesterday. So Graham, somebody who keeps his um, cards very close to his chest, we don't know, quite frankly, how many MPs are privately calling for the Prime Minister to resign. But the fact that these talks keep happening, the fact that Sir Graham is in there just now with the Deputy Prime Minister, Therese Coffey, with the Chairman of the Conservative Party, Jake Berry as well, suggests that Number 10 is very aware of how deep this crisis is and is judging whether it can find its way out. All the time we are getting more Tory MPs who are openly calling for Liz Truss to stand down. It's 14 now, which might not sound like a huge number, but what will worry Downing Street is that it's grown considerably overnight. It was only about half a dozen last night. And those events last night in Parliament, the chaos around that vote on fracking, seem to have made the situation even worse. And I can say that, speaking privately to Tory MPs, some of those who weren't quite in a place yesterday where they were saying the Prime Minister was done are now moving towards that position. There is no doubt that the chaos of yesterday has made the Prime Minister's position even more precarious. The judgment that she will be making in Downing Street as we speak is how precarious that is. And in truth, whether she has any, any chance at all of both getting back some stability in her party and some credibility as Prime Minister. Uh, Nick, for the moment, thank you very much indeed, Nick Eardley there in Downing Street. And let's go live to our political correspondent, Alex Forsyth, who's in the Houses of Parliament. And let's talk more about um, the huge drama we saw there in the Commons last night. Accusations of ministers physically forcing Tory MPs to vote with the government. What has been the fallout there today? 
Well, Ben, this morning there was a sense of the morning after the night before with the real fury continuing. Of course, we know there had been deep unrest within the Conservative Party really since that mini-budget and then Liz Truss's colossal U-turn after. But last night just exacerbated everything. Just a brief reminder of what happened. There was a vote effectively on fracking, the idea of drilling gas out of the ground. Now, Conservative MPs were left unclear about whether that vote was what's called a confidence vote a test of their loyalty to the government. They were going through the voting lobbies. They were totally unclear about what was happening. The chief whip, who is the person in charge of party discipline, at some point felt her, under th her authority had been so undermined. She told Conservative MPs, several have told me, I'm no longer the chief whip. There was a period when no one in government could say whether that was or wasn't the case. We were later told the chief whip and the deputy were still in post. But the level of chaos and confusion has led many Conservative MPs who perhaps privately questioned Liz Truss's authority before to now say is this a government that is really functioning and I think that is why we've seen the number who've publicly come out and called for Liz Truss to go grow throughout the morning. It is worth saying though Ben for those who do want to see Liz Truss removed the problem they still have is this this is not a united party it has not been a united party for some time there is no clarity on the path or the person even that MPs who want to see Liz Truss out might follow. Those conversations are happening at every level of the Conservative Party. There is no doubt this is a moment of great jeopardy for the Prime Minister, but there is also no clarity about what comes next. Alex, thank you very much. Alex Forsyth there in the Houses of Parliament. And uh, let's talk to our business correspondent, Theo Leggett. How are the markets reacting to this huge political turmoil that we're seeing at Westminster? Well, remarkably, Ben, we've had weeks of turmoil on the markets, haven't we? But today they're relatively stable. The government's cost of borrowing has gone down a little bit. The pound is relatively stable. And I think there's a good reason for this. Although the political tensions are rising, there's chaos out there, Economically, the government is more stable than it's been for a few weeks, and that's because the big U-turns have already been done. We had the U-turn on the energy price guarantee, which will now go on until April rather than being an open-ended commitment for two years. We had the U-turns on the mini-budget tax cuts. So a lot of the liabilities that the government was facing, the unfunded liabilities that were making investors nervous, aren't there anymore. And I think there's a feeling now that the Chancellor of the Exchequer's position, Jeremy Hunt's position, is actually pretty strong. He's strong as long as Liz Truss herself is relatively weak. And that means that whoever, whether or not Liz Truss survives, whoever's in charge in, in the foreseeable future is unlikely to row back, do another U-turn on the U-turns. So that position is relatively stable. Um, but things could change because we don't know what the result of arguments within the government over spending plans are going to be. And there's going to be a statement on those on the 31st of October. So we know, for example, that there's a row within the government over immigration. A lot of businesses want to see more skilled immigration because they can't fill the posts they need to in order to grow their companies. But others within the government um, are nervous about this because of the manifesto commitment to reduce immigration. And that was referred to obliquely by Suella Bravo and her resignation letter yesterday. So what we're seeing at the moment is a period of stability because some things are known. The markets have factored in that political instability, but it could always change and could change very suddenly. All right. Well, Thea, thank you very much indeed. Let's just show you the scene once again live now in Downing Street. And we will be back there if we get any more developments as we've been reporting. The Prime Minister is meeting the influential chair of the Conservative backbenchers, Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee. If we get any results from that meeting, we'll bring that to you live here on the BBC News at One. Other news now. And the long-awaited independent inquiry into child sexual abuse has just been published. Amongst wide-ranging reforms, it recommends the mandatory reporting of child sex abuse. It says that if people working with children in England and Wales either know of child abuse or witness it, they should be prosecuted if they fail to report it. Sancha Berg reports. As a teenager, John Viney was abused by an older man, a fellow Jehovah's Witness. For decades, he stayed silent. To stop abuse being hidden, he believes the law has to change. Jehovah's Witnesses particularly were more concerned with their reputation. So we need something like mandatory reporting 
to make sure that the, the, um, the situation is changed and not just reporting but also sanctions necessary so that if people don't obey that particular law that some, um, some action can be taken against them. Now, after seven years of work and nearly £200 million of public money, the independent inquiry on child sex abuse has recommended such a change. Government and society has a moral, ethical and social responsibility to make the safety and protection of children an absolute priority. The country cannot let them down again. There are three key proposals. It should be a criminal offence for those working with children to fail to report child sex abuse. There should be financial redress for those who have been let down in the past by state and non-state institutions. And there should be new authorities set up to improve child protection in England and Wales. The survivors have been heard and it's been a long wait for that. And the mandatory reporting ask in the report is not perfect, but it is better if government has the guts to make it law. If it had been in place when I was a school child, then the abuse that, that we suffered might not have happened. And it could stop the culture of cover up, which is still there, which is institutions putting reputation before the safety and the happiness of children today. Many will welcome the commitment to mandatory reporting, though there are already plenty of questions about how it will work. The biggest question of all is whether the government will adopt these recommendations. Whatever its lasting legacy, the inquiries highlighted a disturbing secret history showing how for decades children were abused and failed by those in power. Sancha Berg, BBC News. Let's talk more about this now with our home editor, Mark Easton, who joins me now. Uh, Mark, seven years in the making. Give us your analysis of the significance of this inquiry report. What this report chronicles is how over a quarter of a century, I think, this country has come to the horrifying realisation of an evil that exists in every crevice and every corner almost of our entire society, child sexual abuse. And the question that we must confront is, I think, is how? How an apparently civilised and cultured society like ours could allow its children to be harmed in this way? Millions of lives diminished, generation after generation, a cycle of suffering. And today's report actually comes up with an answer, but it doesn't make for easy reading. It says that our response to child sexual abuse reflected and reflects our true attitude towards children. We've been treating children as commodities, at, at, at adults' disposal to do with as they wished. When children cried for help, we did not listen, we refused to believe them, and we stayed silent. The report reminds us that at one time there was a belief in what was called a seductive child, that the abuse was not harmful, and that those who challenged what was going on were somehow overzealous, were pursuing some moral panic. Children were only children, it suggested, less important than the, the establishment, the great institutions of church and state, which sought time and time again to protect themselves rather than the, the young people, the children, who they were there to care for. Seven years, and now we do have a report with recommendations for ministers. The Home Secretary has said the government will respond within six months. But I think this report has a greater importance than how the, the, the legal mechanisms of child protection should work. It's designed to be a turning point, a moment when our society confronts the, the unfathomable pain and suffering it's afflicted on children in the past and now. Children today and tonight and tomorrow will be abused, and we all have a responsibility to make it stop. Mark Easton, our home editor, thank you very much indeed. Now, a report by the House of Commons Health and Social Care Committee has warned that what it calls a crisis in general practice in England is putting patients at risk. The MPs say that seeing a GP should not be like phoning a call centre or booking an Uber driver who you will never see again. Here's our health correspondent, Sophie Hutchinson. So last time we were talking about something you had a sore in your mouth and we sent you for a chest x-ray, didn't we? 84-year-old Rob Hurden has come to see his GP because of a mouth condition. And it is his GP. The practice here aims to ensure patients see the same doctor each time. Well done. It's easy for me because I can feel relaxed when I come in and I know that our 
the doctor that I'm seeing or my local doctor that I'm seeing on a regular basis knows me and that, for, that gives me the assurance that our doctors can be straight with us, they can be like a friend. What I'm going to suggest we do is refer you to see the oral mouth specialist. So, Dr Jacob Lee has what's known as a personal list of patients. A tiny fraction of GPs in England have these. He looks after around 400 families. And sometimes what they want to do is to take a little biopsy. Of those 400, we will see about 30% really regularly, um, but I will know probably up to 70% of, of the patients on my list, and I will, out of each family, I'll know somebody in there. When we see a patient for 10 or 15 minutes in an appointment, having continuity means that it's not just 10 or 15 minutes on its own. These are 10 or 15 minutes that mount up, so actually over a year you might see them for an hour, and over two years you might see them for a few hours, and it's this building an understanding about a patient, and the patient builds an understanding about you and, what, and how you're going to support them. Surgeries like this, where doctors and patients tend to know each other, don't just feel better, but evidence suggests they are better. A recent major study from Norway has shown a reduction in hospital emergency admissions and also deaths of up to 30%. Today's report from MPs is urging ministers to prioritise continuity of care where GPs see the same patients. It wants NHS England to reintroduce personal lists for doctors and to require practices to report on progress. The report says without changes like these and others, patient safety is being put at risk and doctors agree. No doubt at all it's a crisis. You know, some practices are remarkably managing to cope, but most practices are really struggling. They're on a knife edge of not just being able to provide high quality personal care, but actually even being able to provide safe care. The government says it's improving GP services. We're going to leave that report and take you straight to Downing Street and our chief political correspondent, Nick Erdley, because, uh, Nick, we are expecting a statement from the Prime Minister. We can see the podium just being put up there behind you outside number 10. We're going to hear from the Prime Minister in the next 10 minutes, Ben. No word yet from number 10 about what exactly she is going to say. <clears throat> but let me just duck out of the way so you can see the lectern there. A sense of the crisis that's been engulfing Downing Street over the past 72 hours or so. The Prime Minister has been holed up in number 10 with Sir Graham Brady. He's the chairman of the powerful committee of Tory backbenchers who often decide the fates of Prime Ministers. She's been in there with some of our key allies as well. As I say, we don't know what she is going to say, but given the level of crisis, putting the podium out in the street, suggest this is quite an important moment. Uh, only a few weeks, of course, since she was at that podium in Downing Street when she won the leadership of the Tory party and became Prime Minister. And only yesterday in the Commons, she was saying, I'm a fighter, not a quitter. Well, look, Ben, it's just five weeks since we stood here in the pouring rain and Liz Truss arrived and said she was going to give that um, that plan for growth which she'd promised over the summer that went catastrophically wrong it led to that crash in the markets the huge turmoil that we've seen in the economy there was a feeling that she could steady the ship on monday by ripping up that plan but what we've seen over the past 24 hours is even more colossal crisis you know the home secretary that remarkable resignation yesterday where the Home Secretary basically laid into the government's plans and suggested the Prime Minister should be resigning. There was then the fact that... There was then the fact that um, the turmoil we saw in Parliament last night, which was incredibly damaging for the Prime Minister's authority as well. Look, Ben, as I say, we don't know exactly what's going to be said by the Prime Minister in around five minutes' time. We can't be sure whether it's going to be bad news or the Prime Minister potentially pledging to fight on. But my sense is, given that this wasn't planned, this was denied to me a couple of hours ago, actually, the level of problems the Prime Minister has faced over the past 24, 48, 72 hours, it suggests 
that we're about to see a really significant moment. Um, and possibly a significant moment because she has just been meeting in the last hour or so, Nick, the influential chairman of the 1922 Committee of Tory Backbenchers. And, and that was a meeting we gather at her request. She wanted to gauge the mood of Conservative Party MPs in the House of Commons. Yeah, look, you're right, Ben. It was the Prime Minister who suggested that meeting with Sir Graham Brady. I should say over the last hour or so, we've also seen the Deputy Prime Minister, Therese Coffey, one of the PM's longest serving allies. She came in. We saw um, the Jake Berry, he's the chairman of the Conservative Party. He's been in there as well. What I can tell you, and I don't know as much as Sir Graham Brady about the mood in the Conservative Party, but what I can tell you is that the mood in the Conservative Party this afternoon has been incredibly bleak. It's been getting worse over the course of the week. When I was making phone calls on Sunday, there were Tory MPs who were saying, this is the end, but there were some who were also saying, let's give it a bit of time. I think there's a sense now that more and more Tory MPs have made it clear, some of them publicly, 15 of them publicly, but a lot privately as well, including to Sir Graham Brady, who've told us but aren't willing to go public yet, they have made it clear that they are unhappy as well. And it's led to this overwhelming sense of crisis within the government, within the Conservative Party, within number 10. And what the question is now is, has Liz Truss be, just been given a message within the past hour that makes it clear to her that she cannot continue? There are Conservative MPs telling me this afternoon that they think it has reached that point, but we don't know. Let's see what the Prime Minister says in the next five minutes or so. What, I, what we do know, just to recap, is we are going to hear from Liz Truss. The lectern is out in Downing Street. The sort of scene that is only reserved for these big, big moments for Prime Ministers. What we do know is that an increasing number of Conservative MPs have broken rank to say that Liz Truss should resign. Considerably more are saying that behind the scenes. What we also know is that Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the influential 1922 committee of Tory backbenchers, the man who often seals the fate of prime ministers, he has been in there for the last hour in crisis talks with the prime minister, the deputy prime minister, the chairman of the Conservative Party. It doesn't look good for Liz Truss. We'll know for sure in the next few minutes what she's going to say. But for the past day, her tenure in number 10 has been hanging by a thread. Hanging by a thread, Nick, but technically, because she has only just won the Tory party leadership, she shouldn't face a challenge under the rules for at least a year. But, but have those sort of technicalities gone out the window, do you feel, at the moment? Yes, I think that is, quite frankly, the answer to the question, Ben. That, that is the case. She is supposed to be safe for a year, but I mean, the truth is, if the last few years have taught us anything, those rules don't dictate what happens. Boris Johnson went, even though he was safe at the time from the leadership challenge, so did Theresa May. The, the thing that often seals the deal for prime ministers is when they think they no longer have the support to go on. And it, it's felt to me for the last 24 hours that we've been getting closer and closer and closer to that point with Liz Truss. Remember, it's only five weeks since we stood here and watched her arrive at that lectern for the first time and to promise the country a plan for growth, to rip up the economic rules and do something new. That went badly and that started the collapse of her authority, the sacking of the Chancellor, ripping up her whole programme for government. That would have been enough to bring down a lot of Prime Ministers. It wasn't enough to bring down Liz Truss, she turned up at Prime Minister's questions yesterday, Ben, said she was a fighter. Has that message changed? Has she decided that actually the fight is up? We're going to find out in the next couple of minutes when Liz Truss comes out to address the nation from that podium in Downing Street. But all day, the mood music has been getting worse and worse and worse. An increasing number of Conservative MPs have been saying publicly that she needs to go. Some have been warning that she had only hours to turn it around. We're about to find out if Liz Truss has taken that message on board and decided to call it a day, or whether 
she has something else to say. We don't know for sure. I've been texting a lot of people in Downing Street and I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> but let's see. The Prime Minister will, will update us all yeah. on BBC One in the next few minutes. Well, well, Nick, we're going to stay with you, if you don't mind, because obviously it's going to be a crucial moment in British political history, potentially. Uh, but one of the things that some commentators have been saying that has been keeping her in Downing Street is that the Tory party can't coalesce around another potential leader and another potential prime minister. That is right. The, the, the biggest war, there are two things that Liz Truss had in her favour. One was the fact that this party is so divided. That might sound strange to say that counts in her favour, but it meant that the party couldn't decide on an alternative that would please everybody. The second was the mechanism. There was no obvious way for Tory MPs to bring down their leader, even if they wanted to do it. The question now is whether they don't need that mechanism and actually Liz Truss herself has decided that the game is up. The other thing that's worth just mentioning is there are some Tory MPs who are really worried, I've been speaking to them this morning, really worried about the impact this will have on their party and on the country. You know, this if Liz Truss was to be removed from office, it would be the third Prime Minister this year. It would be the third Prime Minister without a general election this year. And I think that will just, if it does happen, we don't know, should keep emphasising that. We're not sure what Liz Truss is going to say in the next few minutes. But if that were to happen, the calls for a general election, I think, would grow and grow and grow. And, and Nick, what would that do um, for the Conservative Party's reputation for political stability, I suppose you could say? Um, some would argue that it's already lost or is losing its reputation for economic credibility, um, but also perhaps its reputation for political stability, as you say, if we are to lose another prime minister in such a short space of time. Look, I think you're absolutely right. Um, that question of stability, political stability, is definitely on the cards. I think we're going to hear from the prime minister, just to keep you updated, Ben, within the next couple of minutes. So if you're tuning in now, the Prime Minister is going to be speaking in Downing Street in the next few minutes amid that growing pressure on her leadership, increasing calls for her to resign. She's been holed up in that meeting with Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee. But to answer your question, Ben, there are, there are many people around Westminster who think that the Conservative reputation for stability is gone, quite frankly, that the past few months, the past few days in particular, have absolutely shredded that reputation. The question Liz Truss has been mulling over this morning is whether she has any prospect of bringing it back. We don't know where she's ended up, but the fact the podium is out, half past one, Thursday afternoon in Downing Street, suggests that the crisis has left, reached the stage where Liz Truss feels she can't let it just go on anymore. We'll find out what she has to say in the next minute or so here live in Downing Street. The, the question, the whole question that's been swirling around Westminster over this last 72 hours, Ben, is, is there any chance of Liz Truss getting back her credibility, her authority, and her ability to lead her party? My sense, speaking to MPs this morning, is the answer to those things is probably not. It would be almost impossible to try and lead the party into another general election. So the question that Liz Truss has been weighing up is, is there any point continuing if that's the case? Is there any chance of her trying to get back some of that stability? The door is open. The Prime Minister's here with her husband. I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent. And our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, 
Given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. Well, extraordinary moment in British political history, a moment of huge drama. Liz Truss resigning, as she just told us, as leader of the Conservative Party and therefore as Prime Minister. There will be another Conservative Party leadership election within the next week. Our chief political correspondent, Nick Erdley, is still in Downing Street. Her premiership, Nick, has lasted uh, less time than the leadership campaign that she won. Wow, Ben, what else can you say? What an extraordinary moment in British political history. Liz Truss has been Prime Minister for a month and a half. This has been one of the shortest lived premierships ever in British history. And we've just heard the Prime Minister come out and say she accepts she cannot deliver the vision that she sold to her party and to the country a few weeks ago. This is a really remarkable moment. The re resignation of Prime Ministers is always a big deal, but I've never seen anything like this. And let's be clear what's happened. Yesterday, Liz Truss told us all she was a fighter, that she was going to try and go on. What's happened over the past 24 hours is the level of chaos in government, the level of chaos in Parliament and the Conservative Party has led to a point where Liz Truss knows that she can't continue. And what will happen now is the quickest turnover of power that we've seen in quite some time. The Prime Minister is, has resigned as Tory leader. That's done. Over the next week, there will be a leadership election among Conservative MPs. This is a lightning speed change. The question now is whether the Conservative Party can coalesce around another leader, whether there's anybody that can unite the party. The answer at the moment is no. And whether the party can avoid a general election, because in a week's time, by the end of October, we are going to have our third Prime Minister of the year. Remember, 11 days today, the Chancellor is supposed to set out his plan to fill the fiscal black hole. By that time, Ben, there will be a new Prime Minister. This is a, an unprecedented situation, an unprecedentedly short tenure for a Prime Minister and an unprecedented crisis in British politics. And uh, uh, just to be clear, Nick, this leadership election will only be Tory MPs because, of course, the summer election that Liz Truss won was partly MPs, but then it was for Conservative Party members around the country who ultimately elected her as leader. This will be short and sharp and MPs only. So who do you see as the key candidates? Obviously, Rishi Sunak, one assumes, would be throwing his hat back into the ring. Yeah, look, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's a big question about who is going to take over. I mean, some early names in the frame, I can tell you, Ben. Rishi Sunak, who lost the last leadership election. I think it'll be tough for him. He's quite a divisive figure in the party. There is Penny Mordaunt, who also stood for the leadership, seen by some as too um, inexperienced to take on the job at a time of such crisis. The Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, He's somebody who has suggested he doesn't want the job. I wonder if that might change now, given the level of crisis. Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, somebody who's managed to steady the ship when it comes to the economy, a bit anyway. Maybe he's in the frame, although speaking to Tory MPs this morning, some fear that removing the Chancellor, as well as the Prime Minister, even if it was to swap to put the Chancellor into number 10, would cause even more crisis. I mean, th the truth is, Ben, when I came into work this morning, we knew how bad the situation was for Liz Truss. We weren't sure we were going to end up here. There were some Conservative MPs saying 
She probably has a few days. She maybe has until the end of the month. Well, the level of crisis is such, the level of opposition to the Prime Minister within her own party is such, she's been delivered that message by the 1922 Committee of Backbenchers that it was game over. And now British politics is going to have to pick up the pieces of this remarkably short tenure in Downing Street. I don't know how that is going to pan out. To be honest, so much has caught us by surprise over the past week because it's been so unprecedented. This incredibly short tenure, uh, the humiliation of Liz Truss's programme for government has left this office, number 10, in a very, very strange place this afternoon. Nick, thank you so much for your analysis. Uh, Nick Erdley there, our chief political correspondent, charting what has been a moment of political history in Downing Street. The Prime Minister, Liz Truss, saying that she has spoken to the King, is resigning as leader of the Conservative Party and therefore uh, as Prime Minister there will be a leadership election in the next week she said. She will stay on as Prime Minister until a new leader of the Tory party emerges. Let's just uh, show you again what we heard from Liz Truss outside number 10. I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent. And our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. Liz Truss outside number 10 just a few minutes ago. Let's go to our political editor, Chris Mason in Downing Street. Chris, only yesterday she was saying she's a fighter, not a quitter. She has quit. This is, we're going to have in a week or so, what, the fifth Tory Prime Minister in six years? It's astonishing, isn't it, Ben? Just three and a half months ago, I was standing in this very spot, looking at a lectern in the same spot as the one that was there a couple of minutes ago, uh, reporting on the resignation of the previous Prime Minister from the Conservative leadership. Here we are just a hundred and odd days later and his successor, Liz Truss, performs that same walk and utters a very similar set of words. If you thought yesterday was chaotic, well the chaos is going to deepen uh, and out of the next few days is going to emerge, or at least so the Conservative Party hopes, yet another Prime Minister. They hope they can kind of dredge a name out uh, of their ranks amongst themselves to avoid a contest amongst Conservative Party members of the country, which would take uh, several months, uh, in order to present yet another leader of the country to the country at large. And, and that new Prime Minister, if they can find someone who can unite the party, and that is a massive if, because as you might just have noticed, the Conservatives are not exactly entirely united at the moment, uh, they will then face a massive challenge around legitimacy because a country will look in on that new leader and say, well, who are you and, and where have you come from and what do you stand for and what say did we have? Uh, to which the answer to the last question will be, you know, you won't have had. But we should remember, constitutionally, we live in a parliamentary democracy and if a new Prime Minister can command a majority in the House of Commons, then they have a constitutional right to serve until the next general election legally has to happen. That was the basis upon which Liz Truss 
became Prime Minister, having won the Conservative Party leadership. It's also the basis upon which she is leaving the leadership because she was no longer able to command a majority in the House of Commons and therefore her position uh, was untenable. So we are set for more turbulence, more intrigue and a party, the Conservatives, incredibly aware that over the last five or six weeks their reputation, their brand, in the words of so many of them, has been fed into the shredder. They've got to try and turn that shredder on in reverse, which doesn't work, does it? It's difficult. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to damage limitation as far as their brand is concerned. Very, very conscious that whoever comes next faces all the same questions that Liz Truss faced in terms of the domestic and international picture, which is incredibly difficult. will also face a fractured party and will face the question that they lack a mandate. So a massive couple of weeks coming up and yet another Prime Minister. 2022, the year of three British Prime Ministers at least. Well, Chris, you said whoever comes next. Um, why don't we just speculate about who that might be? We've just heard from the leader of the Commons, Penny Mordaunt, who's advised MPs to keep calm and carry on. Um, she presumably is one of the contenders, as, in, as is Rishi Sunak, the defeated contender from this summer's leadership election. Yeah, I, I note that when people say keep calm and carry on, it's usually because all hell is breaking loose all around them. And, and that's an, an accurate description of what's happening here at Westminster at the moment. Uh, people's ambitions will be rekindled. The expectation after a leadership race is that there's likely to be a period of at least years before another race happens. It's happening again uh, within weeks. So yeah, let's look at some of the, I was going to say runners and riders. There aren't any runners and there aren't any riders yet because so many of those who could potentially take over uh, were not wanting to say very much publicly prior to the resignation uh, of Liz Truss. I'm just learning, uh, courtesy of uh, Nick Erdley, our chief political correspondent, who was talking to you just a few minutes ago and has been back on his phone since he came off the television, uh, that Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, has said he will not stand to be the next Prime Minister, which is in keeping with what he said publicly just a couple of days ago, that his two cracks of the whip at becoming Conservative leader, which both failed, had removed that ambition uh, from his body. So Jeremy Hunt will not be standing as Conservative leader, and I'll hand Nick Erdley his phone back as we continue to talk. So who else is there uh, in the mix? So Richie Sunak, first and foremost, the former Chancellor, the runner-up in the contest uh, over the summer. Uh, one Conservative MP, Ben, said to me the, uh, the other day, Richie Sunak needs to put up or shut up, using the language that John Major used back in the 1990s when he faced questions around his leadership. In other words, this MP was arguing, Rishi Sunak needs to decide what he wants to do. He needs to either say he's keen on the job again or say, you know what, he's had a go and he's not interested to allow the contest to run with or without him. The challenge for him, for Rishi Sunak, uh, is that can he command the support of the party, particularly those who were very loyal to Boris Johnson. Uh, Rishi Sunak accused by supporters of jo Boris Johnson as being one of the architects of Mr Johnson's downfall. Whether that's fair or unfair, doesn't really matter. Perception is reality in politics. So Rishi Sunak is one potential candidate. Jeremy Hunt, we hear, rules himself out. So who else is there? There's Penny Morden, who you mentioned uh, there. Very narrowly missed out on making the final two and the contest in the country amongst Conservative Party members uh, in the summer. If she'd had another half dozen Conservative MPs backing her, she would have made that runoff and I think would have been the favourite to win it up against Rishi Sunak. So can she make the case that can, she can be something of a unifying candidate in these, very, uh, in these times of a complete lack of unity within the Conservative Party? Other name that gets mentioned is Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary. Didn't run last time over the summer, so wasn't seen as being in the mix and in the melee and partisan in any particular way strongly uh, over the summer. Could he argue that he could be some sort of uh, unifying candidate? They are the kind of names. One other name I should mention, because this name crops up in these conversations when I speak to Conservative MPs, Suella Braverman, former Home Secretary, so outspoken in that resignation letter yesterday after her meeting with uh, Liz Truss and her departure from the Home Office. She's seen as a flag bearer of the right of the party, but not universally liked on the right of the party. There are other significant voices on the right of the party who might have one or two things to say about the idea of a Su Suella Braverman candidacy. So that's how it begins to look. 
But then this is a postcode that has plenty of ambition in it. And if you're going to try and unify around a single candidate, or at least whittle the process down, you have to ask people who are often freighted with ambition to press pause on their ambition gene. That's quite hard in a place where, you know, there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be prime minister. So that's the process internally the Conservative Party is embarking on right now with the end product of that process being the new prime minister for the rest of us. Um, Chris, we're just hearing from Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, demanding an immediate general election. I mean, he's been calling for a, a general election for some time now, of course, but saying he wants a general election now. And it goes back to what you were talking about a little bit earlier on about the questions that uh, people may have about the democratic legitimacy of any new prime minister, whoever it is. Yeah, absolutely. And that will be a central challenge for the new prime minister uh, with an added layer of, of absurdity on top of what Liz Truss had to deal with. So she faced the same questions uh, about legitimacy for exactly the same reason. She wasn't on the head of the ticket, if you like, when the Conservatives won the last general election and neither will Liz Truss's successor be. But as I say, you then heap onto the fact that we've then got another prime minister that's just emerged, uh, which adds a sort of layer of absurdity onto that question of legitimacy and as I say there is a constitutional and a political path you can look at here constitutionally if they can command a majority in the House of Commons they have until January 2025 when the current course or end limit of this Parliament runs out to in a constitutional sense legitimately run a government at Westminster if they can command a majority in the House of Commons but politically that clamour from Sir Keir Starmer and for others for a general election will get louder and louder and louder so what will be the political strategy of the new Prime Minister and when you speak to Conservative MPs several senior ones say to me look Whoever the new Prime Minister is, is going to have to address that elephant in the room on day one. Probably, come to think of it, standing at that lectern a few metres behind me and acknowledge that there is uh, a, a perceived democratic deficit here and therefore perhaps say something along the lines of, look, I get that and let's have a general election next summer. But in the meantime, you know, the country faces big challenges, winter's ahead, there's a war in Europe, let's, let's carry on as we are for now and that might allow politically for a Conservative Prime Minister to drag their poll ratings kind of out of the gutter where they are now to a, a place a little further north. I speculate as I mount that argument but that's the conversation you hear among Conservative MPs who wrestle with how you approach that conundrum. There are others who are far far more blunt and just say the argument against a general election will be impossible to stand in the way of and one will have to come along sooner uh, rather than later, which in the short term, when you look at the opinion polls, uh, could be devastating for the Conservatives. Chris, just to go back to the beginning, really, Liz Truss standing down as leader of the party. She's only just been elected to lead and she has been prime minister for 44 days. Um, it's an extraordinary story of political failure, isn't it? It is. It's, it's brutal, uh, it's humiliating, it's devastating for Liz Truss that things could unravel with such ferocity in a matter of just six and a half weeks. The Prime Minister who would start and within days of taking office be the Prime Minister at the passing of the Queen and then so soon out after that would make a great point and great political point of racing out of the traps with this shock and awe strategy, as it was described, of this programme for government, which just exploded on contact with reality, with the markets and with the opinion polls and with her own party. She'll be forever bluntly associated with the pub quiz question about the shortness of her tenure, her failure as Prime Minister. It is absolutely astonishing. And even the biggest critics of Liz Truss, who feared that some of her prospectus for government might encounter trouble with the markets and others, couldn't possibly have imagined the speed with which it would unravel, both politically and economically, forcing upon her at the moment we've just witnessed. Uh, Chris, just a bit of international reaction. President Macron of France has said it's important that uh, the UK finds stability as soon as possible. On a personal level, I'm always sad to see a colleague go. But um, 
Also, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. Um, you may not be entirely surprised to hear this reaction from her. Quote from Nicola Sturgeon, there are no words to describe this utter shambles adequately. It is beyond hyperbole and parody. Uh, reality, though, is that ordinary people are paying the price. So for opposition leaders around the UK, of course, this is a moment of opportunity. It is, because it's a moment where the political landscape changes yet again. And with that comes a recalibration as the opposition parties look in on the Conservative Party. Imagine who their new opponent at the top of that party might be in just a matter of days' time. And then start thinking about how they reorientate their campaigning and their messaging towards a new opponent. And you know what, Ben? Just 40 minutes ago, I was standing in Parliament chewing the fat in the corridor with a senior Labour MP who was talking about how they'd been drafting what might be on their election leaflets given all of the turbulence and what their key messages would be and Labour acknowledging that and they can't quite believe this that you know were there to be an election quite soon they would be highly competitive and the opinion polls suggest they they would win and given where Labour have been that seems like an extraordinary turnaround so absolutely this is one of those moments and we we see them fright quite frequently in the UK at the moment, where the political weather changes again, where all the plates start moving again, and where what looked even briefly to be solid, and that's perhaps to exaggerate at any point uh, Liz Truss's kind of uh, hold on office, suddenly turns to air again, and everything is moving around, everything is unpredictable, and yet again, we're left asking, who will be our Prime Minister in a month's time? And the answer is, we don't know. Are you surprised, Chris, to some extent, that she has gone so quickly in that she did say she was a fighter, not a quitter? Was there any way she could have well, fought on? I mean, because Boris Johnson, of course, faced a whole slew of government resignations. I mean, we had the Home Secretary resigning yesterday, but we hadn't had a whole barrage of resignations in the same way, had we? We haven't, uh, but y you uh, run the counter, which is, uh, you know, what would have happened if we hadn't had that moment now? So she met Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee. It's his job to tell Conservative leaders whether they command uh, the confidence of their party. He's been she's been meeting him pretty much every day for the last few days, saw him at lunchtime today at her request. And if he said to her, which seems likely he did, that she'd lost the trust of the parliamentary party, then, of course, she could have fought on rather than quitted today, perhaps, maybe even tomorrow. But the fact is, a moment would have come where she would have been forced from office rather than being seen to voluntarily walk the plank. Now, those two things add up to the same thing because a prime minister becomes an ex-prime minister in pretty short order. But in the end, I suppose, in a situation as desperate and humbling and embarrassing and crushing as this is for any person. You know, put yourself into Liz Truss's shoes, detach yourself from the politics in just a moment and um, imagine the heaviness in her heart walking out just six weeks on from when she did. Her husband, you'll have spotted, came out at the same time. What a difficult moment for her. And in that moment, I suspect, I thought that if the alternative is some moment in Parliament where you're humiliated very visibly and very audibly, if that's the alternative to coming out at a moment of your choosing, kind of, even if a bigger moment was only just a couple of days away, perhaps in the end, the lesser of two horrible, horrible options, that that's the one you would choose. So I think she would argue she fought until quitting was inevitable. Um, just one last question, Chris, and then I'll let you go to go and get reaction from uh, everybody else at Westminster there. But, I mean, yesterday at Primus's Questions, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, opened by saying, uh, there's a book, I'm told there's a book about you, Prime Minister. Um, it's called Out by Christmas. Is, is, that, is that the uh, release date or the title? And um, she's out by the end of October. Yeah, quite. I, as it turns out, incidentally, I understand that that book, uh, written by Harry Coley, political editor of The Sun, and a, and a second author as well, had already had its title changed to Out of the Blue, which neatly captures any kind of consequence, doesn't it? And uh, obviously, blue being the, the, the colour of the Conservative Party. I suspect there's a, at least an additional final and first chapter being 
bashed out rather rapidly uh, for, for that particular tome. But yeah, I mean, she was the subject, wasn't she, of mirth and ridicule from the opposition parties yesterday. Again, not the place any Prime Minister ever, ever wants to be uh, wants to be in. And, you know, it won't be the only book, that book you refer to, about uh, Liz Truss, because the sheer scale and headline-making nature of her rise and fall, the roller coaster of uh, the uh, the Liz Truss Premiership, the shortest roller coaster, but also the steepest roller coaster in contemporary British political history, uh, will be subject to a huge amount of analysis and scrutiny and history, because that's what it is. It's a history-defining Premiership, from her perspective, for all the wrong reasons. Chris, very grateful to you for all your time there in bringing us the latest on what has been an extraordinarily dramatic day outside number 10 Downing Street with Liz Truss announcing her resignation as leader of the Conservative Party. There will be a new leader and a new Prime Minister within a week. Well, welcome to viewers uh, both here in the UK and right around the world. The British Prime Minister Liz Truss has resigned after little more than six weeks in office, 44 days in all, marked by some of the greatest turmoil in post-war British politics. Liz Truss has admitted in the last few minutes she could no longer deliver the mandate that she was elected on. Her decision followed a meeting with the senior Conservative Party backbencher Sir Graham Brady. The Conservatives will hold an election to replace her within the next week, producing the third British Prime Minister since the summer. The Labour Party has uh, called for an immediate general election. In a brief statement in Downing Street, Liz Truss blamed turbulent economic conditions for the trouble her government's run into. I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent and our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. Well, what a moment in Downing Street there. Liz Truss resigning as Tory party leader. There'll be a new prime minister within a week. Uh, just some early reaction from the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, who has renewed his calls for an immediate general election. And Scotland's first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, saying that a general election is a democratic imperative after the resignation of the prime minister. There are no words, said Nicola Sturgeon, to describe this utter shambles adequately. Uh, let's get more from our chief political correspondent, Nick Erdley, who's in Downing Street. And those calls from opposition leaders, Nick, for a general election now are just going to get louder and louder. I think they are, Ben. And, you know, standing here this afternoon, it's very hard to see how some Conservative MPs won't end up in a similar sort of place. You know, that privately, there are some Tory MPs who think it probably is time to have a general election because within a week, we're going to have the third Prime Minister this year. We're going to have the second Prime Minister in a row who's come in without a general election. So I think you're right, that pressure will absolutely grow. In the meantime, the, 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 the government, the Conservative Party, the governing Conservative Party, has to work out 
who comes next. It has a week to do it and it is going to be a massively cut short process. They're gonna to have to figure out very quickly who wants the stand, who doesn't want to stand. The one piece of cast iron information I can give you just now is that Jeremy Hunt won't stand for that position. Partly, I think, because he wants to stay as chancellor and try and maintain some sense of stability when it comes to the economy. His plan, by the way, is still to have that big fiscal statement on the 31st of October. New Prime Minister, I suppose, might have different thoughts on that. But there will be a lot of senior Conservatives just now deciding whether or not they will stand. I think it's quite possible Rishi Sunak will. Nothing from his team yet, but certainly his supporters view, some of them anyway who I've been speaking to over the past couple of days, is that he is the man who came second last time. He didn't actually lose by that much in the end, and he actually warned about a lot of the problems we've seen over the past five weeks when Liz Truss has been Prime Minister. I think it's quite possible Suella Braverman will think about standing. She was Home Secretary until yesterday. She quit with that excoriating letter, which just added more weight onto Liz Truss's shoulders. Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, no word from him yet. He decided against it last time. Maybe this time he might decide that he will stand. Um, and there are other names, of course, doing the rounds, like Penny Mordaunt, the, the leader of the Commons. But Ben, stand back from this for a second. This is an unprecedented situation. Liz Truss has only been Prime Minister for five weeks. It's a humiliation for her programme for government. It's a humiliation, frankly, personally, for her as well. And now the Conservative Party, the bitterly divided Conservative Party, has to decide within a week who the new Prime Minister is going to be. I'm almost certain that that will be a rapid process of MPs whittling a list down over the next few days. That's not been confirmed yet. We'll hear from Sir Graham Brady, I would expect, within the next wee while, um, probably this afternoon. But that is a, another extraordinary moment. Conservative MPs have a lot on their shoulders over the next few days, deciding who the next Prime Minister is going to be and how on earth that person gets the, the government, the governing party, and the politics of the UK out of this mess. And, and just assuming it is MPs only who make this decision, which it, I guess it has to be given the time scale and the time frame, only a week, you know, that whole idea of the Conservative Party at large and those 160,000 members who went through that pretty long and tortuous um, selection process over the summer, that's gone out the window, hasn't it? I mean, it absolutely has been. We'll find out the exact details of that shortly from Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee. I mean, look, I, I, I think in normal circumstances, the idea that Conservative members would be cut out of this process would cause a massive rout. I suspect in this situation, given the scale of the crisis, it won't. And I suspect a lot of people at home might be wondering, well, who really cares? Let's just get on with it. We need to try and get some sort of stability back at the very heart of government. Are we going to get that? Anyone's guess, to be honest. We, we don't know exactly what Conservative MPs will decide. I have spoken to a lot of them over the past few days. The sense I get is that there isn't any sort of unity candidate. There's nobody that can get that divided party behind it right now, standing here at two o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Will that change? Maybe. The gravity of the crisis is such that maybe they'll just have to. Um, who it is, as I say, we've just gone over some of the names. I should also point out, although my sense is it's extremely unlikely, Nadine Doris, the former culture secretary, is already saying that Boris Johnson should be a man on everybody's lips. Maybe he should be the man to make a comeback, given that he's the one that got the electoral mandate back in 2019. But Ben, look, I mean, I, I mean, I've not been in politics for as long as some people. I've been here at Westminster for about six years. But having spoken to some longer serving colleagues, some MPs who've been here for decades, I don't think anybody's seen a crisis like this. And the big question that the government now faces, what's left of the government, the big question the Conservative Party faces, the big question the country wants answers to, is how on earth does, does, the, does the 
does the government get out of this crisis? Nick, thank you so much. Uh, for the moment, Nick Early there, our chief political correspondent, on a day of extraordinary political drama in Downing Street, Liz Truss is resigning as leader of the Conservative Party and therefore as uh, Prime Minister. She's been Prime Minister, just to remind you, for a total of 44 days. There will now be a leadership election, as Nick was just telling us, and that will uh, last a week or so. So uh, she will stay on as Prime Minister until that process is completed, and then she will leave 10 Downing Street after, what, potentially around 50 days. Um, let's get some reaction now from my colleague Anita McVeigh, who is at Westminster for us this afternoon. Anita. Ben, thank you very much. And Ben, as you were mentioning, in fact, the leadership contest lasted for longer than Liz Truss's premiership has. It's, it's quite an astonishing statistic. And I was just reflecting how dizzying it is that it was just on the 6th of September that I watched Boris Johnson give his last speech as Prime Minister in Downing Street today. Um, we've watched Liz Truss deliver hers, his successor. Who would have thought that by next week, we're told, uh, we will have another Prime Minister. No surprise then that we expect uh, the chairman of the 1922 Committee of Backbenchers, Sir Graham Brady. Um, that's the group of backbenchers responsible for running Conservative leadership contests. We're going to hear from him very soon, we're told. If he's only got a week to run that election, yes, he certainly needs to get on and tell everyone how that is going to happen. Well, with me to try to reflect at the uh, dizzying speed at which events have unfolded and where we are with all of this, Kevin Schofield, political editor of HuffPost UK. Kevin, thanks very much for joining me. Um, your thoughts this afternoon? Yeah, I mean, it's just remarkable, isn't it? 24 hours ago, um, Liz Truss said she was a fighter, not a quitter, and now she's gone. I think events really took a real terminal turn for her last night with the chaos over the fracking vote. I think that just uh, writ large how um, the, the Tory party was in meltdown, essentially. She had no authority, couldn't even work out whether it was a confidence motion that MPs were voting on or not. And I think even then, probably any MPs who were wavering, maybe even then willing to give her a second chance, probably thought to themselves, it's all over. And it's a reminder, isn't it, that no PM is, is bigger than the parliamentary party? Well, exactly. I mean, the, the rules of the 1922 committee are that a new prime minister has a year before they can be challenged. But it just shows that those rules don't really mean anything if they lose the support of the vast majority of their MPs and probably our cabinet as well. So I think it, it's seemed pretty clear since last Friday when she sat quasi quarting, you turned on the mini budget that um, time was running out. Although I don't think many of us thought it would um, escalate quite so quickly, but I think it just shows how febrile things are here at the moment. And whoever comes in next is, uh, as the Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister will face an incredibly difficult job. So it, it seems as this decision, the next Prime Minister, will be taken just by the, the Parliamentary Party, uh, given the short amount of time in which it's going to be done. It's a, an awfully tall order, Kevin, to find someone who is going to unify what is a pretty disunited party right now. Yeah, that is incredibly fractious. There's all sorts of tribes within the Parliamentary Party now, splits from top to bottom. So how they're going to come up with a candidate who will um, secure the support of all of them, I think, is going to be impossible. It's whether or not they can secure the support of enough to keep them going, to keep the show on the road until the next general election, because, as I say, you've got the likes of Suella Braverman on the right of the party, you've got people like um, Jeremy Hunt on the other end of the party. How you bring and he, those he people... he said he won't stand. He said he won't stand, but he still represents a wing of the party, and how, you're, how you can be a leader of both those wings, as we've seen, Boris Johnson couldn't do it, Liz Truss couldn't do it. I mean, it's going to be very difficult for whoever comes next to try and, first of all, lead the party before they can think about leading the country as a whole. So does that lead us towards the parliamentary party looking perhaps towards a more centrist, can centrist candidate? And if that was the case, who do you think that might be? Uh, I think Penny Mordaunt will be there or thereabouts. Ben Wallace, I think, could well be someone who's seen as um, neither one wing or the other uh, has done a reasonably good job as defence secretary so I think he might well be in with a good shout. I think Rishi Sunak, is, although he's the bookies favourite, I think he might 
be he might struggle because as we saw during the um, the last leadership election during the summer, you know, a lot of um, Tory MPs and members don't like Mr Sunak because they blame him for bringing down Boris Johnson. Now, Gary Streeter was one of the MPs who publicly declared earlier that he had no faith in, no confidence in Liz Truss to continue as Prime Minister. He said even if the Angel Gabriel was to, to be the next leader, just looking at the quote, what is urgently required is the party rediscovering discipline, mutual respect and teamwork. Um, do you really think they're going to be able to put on a united front in a week, even though they must know, whatever wing of the party they come from, that if they don't put on that united front, it, it, it's going to look frankly ridiculous, isn't it, many would say? Well, it is because, you know, they've all given so many quotes over the last few weeks supporting one candidate during the last leadership election, supporting Liz Trust and criticising Rishi Sunak. So if Rishi Sunak were to become leader, all those quotes that his new colleagues and probably cabinet members have made in the past about him would be thrown back in their faces. As I say, there's so much blood in the water and it's going to be so difficult, I think, for any Conservative leader to bring the party together. The one thing that will unite them, however, is the prospect of a general election. And at the moment, they're looking at a Conservative wipeout if the opinion polls are to be believed. So really, what they need to do now, I think, is focus on the common enemy, which is the Labour Party, and that might just knock a few heads together and force them to come together and try to salvage as much as they can from the next general election. It hasn't so far. What makes you think it might change? Because this is their final chance. Um, I think they've, they've, they realise that, uh, well, we can't have another Prime Minister after this one. I mean, this has to be the last uh, Tory leader before the next general election, at which point they will be facing a Labour Party which is riding high in the polls, very confident uh, that they're heading for power. So, you know, if there's one thing that the Conservative Party is good at, usually it's clinging on to power, and I think we'll see all those survival instincts kick in the closer we get to the next election. OK, Kevin, good to talk to you. Kevin Schofield, uh, political editor at HuffPost UK. Um, so uh, Liz Truss saying there in her resignation speech just uh, 44 days in office as prime minister that she had not been able to uh, deliver the mandate on which she had been elected to lead the party to become prime minister. So just 44 days in office, uh, the election campaign to become leader longer than her period as PM. Well, joining me now is Kirsten Oswald, uh, SNP MP. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for joining me as well today. Um, first of all, give us your thoughts. It's the obvious... Oh, I'm going to pause you, Kirsten. Here's Sir Graham Brady, Chairman of the 1922 Committee. Party uh, being consulted uh, by Friday next week. Do you accept that this is? Do you accept that this is a complete dog's dinner? It's, um, it, it's certainly not a circumstance I would wish to see. So, Graham, will you have to make the threshold for nominations really high in order to flush out candidates? You just can't waste time on this now, can you? I, I think these are uh, details that will be clear later on. Uh, I don't, haven't got any more details to share with you now, but there will be some clarity later this afternoon. And how disappointed here. are you? Just, just one more question. How disappointed are you in this? This is the fourth, third Prime Minister in four months. The public must be looking at this thinking, what on earth is going on? This is the governing party. Absolutely. And and they are uh, absolutely. And I, I think we are deeply conscious uh, of the imperative in the national interest of resolving this uh, clearly. And quickly. So there not just be a general election, Sir Graham. There not just be a general election. How can uh, you continue to uh, keep clearly, the next clearly election? Clearly, isn't the matter. Uh, isn't the matter for me. Will there definitely be two candidates going forward to the membership? Uh, the uh, party's rules say there will be two candidates unless there is only one candidate. So if somebody uh, drops is, out, if somebody uh, drops out, it could only be one. If there is only one candidate, there is only one candidate. I really can't give you any more that, detail. Whose idea, so again, was it to have this contest truncated to one week? Was it Liz Truss's idea or was it your proposal? I, I, think, uh, I think it's a, a, a matter on which there is a pretty broad consensus. And is that because Thank of you. the Thank you. Are you live? Thank you. Are you live? That was good. That was good. Sorry, the Tories will pick. Nathan, we're doing a live uh, with Ian. Sue. Well, there is Sir Graham Brady, who's a, a pivotal figure in the Conservative Party. Um, he is the uh, chair of the 1922 Committee of Backbench MPs. He's very, very influential. He it was who went into Downing Street this morning to see the Prime Minister. She had asked to see him uh, to gauge the mood of Tory MPs, and it's pretty clear. 
he uh, gave her a pretty negative message because that then led to her walking out and announcing her resignation. And he has just spelt out what will happen in terms of the leadership election now to find a replacement for Liz Truss. And it will go to party members. Um, let's go back to our chief political correspondent, Nick Erdley. Um, well, it, it's not going to be just MPs. Just talk us through what we heard there from Graham Brady. Well, look, Ben, let's wait and see what happens over the next few hours, because what Sir Graham Brady said is that, as things stand, the rules are that the last two go to the membership, unless there's only one left. So that does suggest to me there is still a bit wriggle room. And one of the wheezes that's been discussed in Parliament over the last few days is the MPs could set such a high threshold that only a MP with a lot of support would get there. I'm not certain what's going to happen, to be frankly honest with you. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, this is an unprecedented crisis, unprecedented situation. Uh, for Conservative MPs, it's an unprecedented situation to be in. So what happens now? Well, I think we will get more details by the close of play today from what Sir Graham just said. I think he will be conscious that you need to spell out how the next Prime Minister is going to be chosen if the next Prime Minister is going to be in number 10 by within the week. Um, what's, what's likely to happen? I think there are a lot of MPs who do not want this to go to the Conservative Party membership, who are worried about that and think that you just need to get it over and done with as soon as possible. The logistics of trying to consult the membership within a week are extremely hard to figure out unless it was a quick online ballot, but even then you'd have to whittle it down to the last two extremely quickly. So we wait for more details on exactly what happens. Yeah, so Graham Brady just said um, that the new Prime Minister will be in place before the fiscal statement on October the 31st, which is obviously a, a, a crucial date. As you say, they would clearly like one candidate to emerge. Um, you know, who is that going to be, though? How likely is that, that the whole parliamentary party can coalesce around one candidate? It's unlikely, is the simple answer, Ben. This morning, it seemed pretty much impossible to me, actually, when I was chatting to Tory MPs in Parliament. I mean, we should emphasise the reason that we keep talking about Conservative MPs is they are so influential at the moment. You know, for the second time this year, they are going to pay, play an absolutely key role in deciding who our next Prime Minister is, either whittling it down to the last two or choosing the person themselves. Um, can they coalesce around one person at the moment? I think it's extraordinarily hard to see. The names doing the rounds already in my WhatsApp are Rishi Sunak. I think his supporters will inevitably argue that he came second last time and he got a lot of it right when it came to the dangers of inflation. That's what they will say. I think Suella Braverman, who resigned as Home Secretary yesterday, is ambitious and she may fancy a tilt at trying to be the candidate of the right this time. Remember that Liz Truss beat her to that mantle last time and that allowed Liz Truss to get into the final two. Uh, Penny Mordaunt, maybe. I know a lot of MPs have concerns that she's not been tested in a crisis situation before, so may not be the right person, but she's potentially someone that will be sitting in her office right now weighing up the options. Keep an eye on Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary. He didn't stand last time. I've been asking some of his allies within the past hour if he might stand. No answer just yet. Maybe that means they're weighing it up. Maybe we shouldn't read too much into it, but I think there will be some pressure on him to stand. I know that some of his cabinet colleagues have been making the case for him behind closed doors over the last few days. There are other names out there, Ben. I suspect Kemi Badenoch will have a think about it, given that she was popular with a lot of Tory MPs last time. Maybe the former Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, but it's a long list, isn't it? There's no clear person there that would be a runaway favourite. I think my sense is that Rishi Sunak would be the favourite to get the most support among MPs simply because he did last time. But they will be very conscious that he is divisive, particularly among supporters of Boris Johnson, who thinks that he stabbed the former Prime Minister in the back when he resigned. And Boris Johnson, what about it? Maybe, just maybe? The former Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries is suggesting it already, that he's the only man with a mandate. I think, I think it's unlikely, but 
And likely things happen around this postcode a lot just now. Um, Chris Mason, our political editor, your colleague, asked uh, Sir Graham Brady, it's all a dog's dinner, isn't it? And he said in reply, well, it's not a circumstance I would wish to see. I mean, clearly embarrassed, really, by this whole situation uh, and wanting to get all of this done within a matter of days. Well, look, I think Tory MPs feel quite humiliated by it, actually. You know, the level of embarrassment I've picked up over the last few days, the level of feeling that this is just, the, the, the show has completely come off the road, there are no wheels left on the car, things are extraordinarily bad. Um, I, I think a lot of them have, have given up, quite frankly, certainly among those I've spoken to in the last few days. I've spoken to ministers who are dusting off their CVs, with a view to losing their seat and having to find something else to do. It's, it is a complete mess. It is chaos. And I think the question that Tory MPs are going to have to face up to in the next few hours is how do they give the impression that they can move on from this? Can they give that impression? There will be a lot of people arguing that it's impossible. The Labour Party are already arguing that there needs to be a general election because the Conservatives have lost the mandate to govern, the ability to unite the party, that the division is just so bad that for the case of the economy and the country, it's time to move on. Other opposition parties will agree with that. SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon has been saying it, the Lib Dem leader Ed Davey as well. So there's a big challenge ahead for Conservative MPs over the next few days to get this done, to get someone else into this postcode, into this address, I should say, within the next week. And that person, Ben, will face an extraordinary situation because a week on Friday, or maybe not a week, on, I've lost my dates, the 31st of October, whenever that is, that's the Monday, <laughs> isn't it? That is going to be the state as things stand. That is the day that the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, is supposed to be giving a big update on how on earth the government is going to fill the massive fiscal black hole that has been run up with some of the plans that have been emerged over the last few weeks under Liz Truss. He's got a huge challenge, but before that, he's facing a new Prime Minister. They'll possibly only have three days to make sure their plans add up with each other's. Nick, good to have you with us once again. Nick, early there, our Chief Political Correspondent in a slightly drizzly Downing Street, um, also a Downing Street that has seen extraordinary moments in the last couple of hours with Liz Truss announcing her resignation as leader of the uh, Conservative Party. As Nick was saying there, uh, a new Prime Minister should be in place within a few days once there has been that Tory party leadership contest. Let's go for more reaction back to my colleague Anita McVeigh at Westminster. Ben, thank you very much for that. Yes, yeah, so by next Friday, the 28th of October, we're told that there will be a new Prime Minister in place. And you would think that one of the, the lessons of what's unfolded since Liz Truss became Prime Minister is that the Prime Minister of the day has to, above all else, enjoy the support of her or his parliamentary party. But we did, did hear there from Sir Graham Brady, Chairman of the 1922 Committee, that the membership will somehow be included in this decision-making process just a week, so a really fast timetable. Let's get some reaction now from Kirsten Oswald, uh, SNP MP. Kirsten, thank you very much for uh, joining me. You may want to just tuck yourself in ever so slightly as the rain uh, pours down. Um, first of all, just take stock for us about what's happened in the last couple of hours. I mean, obviously, there were suggestions that this moment was coming. Still extraordinary to see. It is extraordinary and, you know, I, I suppose we could use that word to describe almost um, any number of events over the, the last weeks and, and months, actually. Um, and, you know, perhaps it is extraordinary to see, but I, I think for a lot of people it's not before time. Um, I think that there have been calls even from within the Conservative Party for the Prime Minister to go and, and it is absolutely right that she has done so. But I think that there are an awful lot of unanswered questions remaining. We're, we've heard about the desire from the Conservatives to have another Prime Minister in place within a week from now and um, quite confusing to me ideas about how they are going to make that happen by consulting their members but there's obviously a big elephant in the room there. There are people that should be consulted about who the Prime Minister should be and that's the general public. That's what's missing here. This has been a a real democratic issue and it's getting a bigger one if there is a suggestion that we should simply accept 
another Prime Minister who we didn't vote for being imposed upon us. But the bottom line is there is no mechanism to get to a general election. You want one, the Lib Dems have called for one, Labour is calling for one, but there isn't a mechanism to get to that point, is there? Well, do you know, that actually is something that the Tory members of Parliament need to think about for themselves. They, they need to grow a backbone on this, um, if I might say so. It's not good enough that we have this continued chaos, this notion that we just slot someone else in to uh, an office and that we all carry on. I mean, there, there are so many people who've been slotted into office recently. It, this is not a, how a democracy should work. Westminster is not working. It's not functioning at all. And I think particularly for people in Scotland who've not voted for a Tory government since 1955, to have yet another Tory Prime Minister who we didn't vote for imposed upon us after all the chaos and damage that Theresa May has, uh, I beg your pardon, so many Prime Ministers that Liz Truss has wrought in her short tenure, I think is really a step too far. People are paying a heavy price with things like mortgages for the, the damage that she has caused. I, I hope um, that everyone can hear us clearly over the sound of the rain, which is coming down heavily now. We'll do our best to make ourselves heard. I listened to a radio interview recently and um, the person on the call was saying that what was happening here was a recruiting sergeant for Scottish independence. I mean, to what extent do you think that's true? I mean, I think anyone, you know, whether in Scotland or anywhere else, actually looking at this shambles that we have had to deal with over the, the past weeks and months would certainly very reasonably think that there must be a better way of doing things. And so it's no surprise that people in Scotland are looking at Westminster and saying, this is ridiculous, it's anti-democratic, it's chaotic, it's costing us money, it's damaging people's lives. Of course, there is a better way, and there, there absolutely is a better way. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm clearly of the mind that, that Scottish independence can't come soon enough. And I think that the chaos here really demonstrates for me and for so many others that we can do so much better than this. If any other party, hypothetically, was, was looking for a new leader, do you think doing it in a week would be a, a pretty tall order? I mean, it seems like a bonkers suggestion to me. I can't imagine how that's going to be a, a workable, properly organised, transparent um, contest. I would imagine that it will lead to a lot of questions uh, from those who want to participate in the contest as well as those who support them. But again, I go back to the fact that most of the people asking questions about how proper this is and how democratic this is are going to be the people outside the Westminster bubble who I think probably find it unforgivable that we have Rammies in the lobbies, we have people's mortgages going up at really huge rates because of the actions of this government and they don't have a say. That's not sustainable. Kirsten Oswald, thank you very much. Kirsten Oswald there, uh, MP for the SNP here at Westminster, uh, focusing there on what uh, her argument is, that this is not democratic for the Conservative Party to then appoint another Prime Minister. Obviously, we had Boris Johnson. He was elected, huge majority. When he was replaced by Liz Truss, that was a vote among the party's own MPs and the wider party membership. Now we're moving to another very truncated one-week voting process, again among the party's MPs and membership, we're told, to choose another Conservative Prime Minister. A, a really, really short time frame, and uh, Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee, who will be running that contest uh, saying that he will set out more details about how that is going to happen uh, a little later on today. Obviously, he's got to go into fast forward, like the rest of the Conservative Party, in order to meet that time frame. And uh, joining me now is... Uh, actually, I'm going to have a guest in just a moment, but I think I need to go back to the studio right now to my colleague Ben Brown. Ben. Yeah, Anita, thank you very much indeed, because we've had some reaction in the last couple of minutes from the Labour leader, uh, Sir Keir Starmer. He has been saying there has to be an immediate general election in the wake of Liz Truss's resignation, uh, saying after 12 years of Tory failure, the British people deserve more than this revolving door of chaos. Let's have a listen to what Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, has been saying in the last couple of minutes. Well, what a mess. And this is not just a soap opera at the top of the Tory party. It's doing huge damage to our economy, and to the reputation of our country. And the public are paying with higher prices, with higher mortgages. So we can't have a revolving door of chaos. We can't have another experiment at the top of the Tory party. 
there is an alternative, and that's a stable Labour government. And the public are entitled to have their say, and that's why there should be a general election. Some sympathy for Liz Truss, her time in office, pretty humiliating. The damage that has been inflicted on the public through higher prices and mortgages is considerable. This is not a soap opera. These are real lives that are being impacted by the mess at the top of the Tory party. We've had this revolving door. We've had these experiments at the top of the Tory party. The public are entitled to choose between this utter chaos um, and a Labour Party which will stabilise the economy and have got a clear plan for growth, for living standards and for jobs of the future. We need a general election so the public can make their mind up about this utter chaos. Isn't there an argument that a general election might actually prolong the instability to an outcome of that general election? Do we need more instability now or just a chance for a clean state and just to stabilise the ship? The risk at the moment is continuing with this chaos not having a stable Labour government. So that's why there should be a general election. We can't just allow the Tory party to keep putting up the next candidate in the middle of this chaos. There is a choice. There's a Labour party that's capable of you know, stabilising the economy, has a clear plan, um, and the public entitled to choose between that stable Labour government and this utter chaos of the Conservatives. Are you ready for government? This is not the context you would have wanted to take over. We are ready to form a government to stabilise the economy and implement a real plan for growth, for living standards, to help people through a cost of living crisis. And that's the choice now, a stable Labour government or this utter chaos from the Conservatives. So that's the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, demanding an immediate uh, general election. In the shorter term, though, let's just recap on what we've heard from Sir Graham Brady, who's chair of the Tory 1922 Committee of Backbenchers, who has been talking about how the leadership election is going to take place. And he has been saying that he expects a new leader to be in place by uh, Friday the 28th of October. And that is significant because it's just before the scheduled fiscal statement, um, which uh, the government will be delivering on the country's finances on October the 31st. So a new uh, leader will be in place, says Sir Graham Brady, by October the 28th, uh, Friday, October the 28th. Uh, but exactly how that election is going to take place isn't quite clear. It depends on how many potential candidates there are. Uh, so watch this space on that. Let's go back to Anita McVeigh, who's uh, just outside the Houses of Parliament. Anita. Uh, thanks, Ben, and I actually have the uh, ideal guest with me to talk about the processes, what happens, the procedures from here on in. That's a senior fellow at the Institute for Government, Dr Catherine Haddon. Catherine, thank you very much for joining us. It was interesting to hear uh, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, characterise what's going to happen next, this one-week process to choose another Conservative leader and Prime Minister as an experiment at the top of the Conservative Party, and he, along with other Political parties are calling for a general election. Members of the public get in touch, have been getting in touch a lot recently to say, why isn't there a general election in these circumstances? Yeah, the reason is uh, because the Conservative Party don't want one and they have, in theory, a working majority. So they're able to command co com uh, confidence in the Commons, which is the, the key to being able to form a government. So in theory, you don't need a general election because you ought to have a stable government. The problem is, if they can't actually form stable governments, you know, we have another failed governments, they can't manage to control the political party and get legislation through, then the pressure increases and constitutionally, whether there's a confidence vote or not, the correct sort of outcome is for a general election because you have to be able to form stable governments. That's the entire purpose of uh, general elections is to form a majority so that we can have stable government. So even though we've just had what's unfolded over the last few weeks, weeks during Liz Truss's premiership, uh, because in theory, as you say, the party commands a majority, that's why we're not having a general yeah. election. But presumably there are only a certain number of times that scenario could be allowed to unfold. Do you think if this happened all over again, that would yeah. be it, would be into general election territory? Absolutely. And this is really the, the big question mark that the Conservative Party have to solve in the next week, because it's all very well saying we want anyone but Liz Truss now, having got rid of Boris Johnson before that. 
but they still they not only have to find somebody that is acceptable to them and it is most important that it's acceptable to the uh, political part the parliamentary party so they may want to bring the membership into it but if they don't have the confidence of the parliamentary party you can't command confidence you can't form a stable government uh, you know you you have to get out of the way and call a general election or pass it over to to the opposition that's how the constitution works those are the principles behind it but it is it is very tricky without a sort of formal vote we saw it last night if that was a confidence vote if it had fallen then the question would be asked um, about having a general election but because it wasn't uh, or because they, they managed to get through it, we are now in this situation today. Yeah, so how do you think the party is actually going to do this in the space of a week, you know, compared to the election campaign that we saw run through the summer, all those hustings, what, the best part of a couple of months? Yeah. I mean, the, the leadership rules that we've got in place now are entirely because back in the day, 1963 and before, it would be, you know, what was called the men in grey suits, but it would usually be men getting around together to decide who should be the next leader. Um, and probably similar will happen at the moment. We don't, I don't think we heard from Graham Brady earlier about the threshold of being able to get onto the ballot paper. We didn't, no. So they could put that very high. So only if you've got the support of 50, maybe more MPs, can you even get onto it. That would stop too many rounds going through. Um, and it could be that actually enough MPs talk to each other, decide not to campaign, that actually it coalesces around one candidate, which is what happened in 2003 with Michael Howard. Um, that is their best chance of avoiding the membership getting involved um, and therefore rallying around a unity candidate. But there won't be a lot of people watching that have confidence they can do that. Yeah, of course, Graham Brady can't predict that that is going to be what happens and therefore the membership might be involved. Just to, to repeat the point, it, it bears repetition, doesn't it? Clearly, we've seen with Liz Truss that the PM of the day has to command the respect, the support of a majority of the parliamentary party above all else in order to actually get on with the business of the day. Yeah. So do you think that this might be weighted in some way so that the parliamentary party's votes carry a greater weight than those of the wider party membership? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that is one way of doing it. I, I think the question is, they talked about consulting them. Um, I, I honestly don't know what they have in mind. I think perhaps Brady's hasn't worked out what the details will be. Well, we haven't been in this sort of situation before, exactly. have we? Exactly. So they're trying to both give it a semblance of some kind of democracy with a small d within their party, but at the same time, they're trying to find a quick workaround that, that allows them to solve this in what, you know, the grey suits, as I say, think is the most sensible fashion. But. It's hard to do when you've got a party that is so split into different factions and when there is so much blood in the water of people who are annoyed with other people um, and don't want them to be the leader of their party. So uh, it's a real challenge for them as a political party and a general election is something that needs to be sitting there as a threat if they cannot resolve this because we do need stable government. Dr. Catherine Haddon, Senior Fellow at the Institute for Government, thank you very much. Yes, uh, really new territory for everyone in terms of the process unfolding over the next week. Just by next Friday, uh, we're told that uh, we are going to have a new Prime Minister, so just that short period of time uh, to elect a new leader, but an election that happens, as we were just discussing, purely within the Conservative Party. Uh, for the moment, back to you, Ben. Yeah, Anita, that's absolutely right. By next Friday, October the 28th, uh, that is what Sir Graham Brady has said, the chair of the 1922 committee. We're still awaiting more details exactly how that Tory leadership race is uh, going to work. He was saying the expectation is that the Conservative Party members will be involved in the process. But that's assuming there are uh, two contenders at the end of uh, that process. Um, and if there's only one contender, it wouldn't have to necessarily go to the wider party membership. But anyway, the expectation is uh, the Tory party will have a new leader by October the 28th. And that's significant because it's just ahead of the government's fiscal statement, um, which is going to be on October the 31st on Halloween. And uh, let's talk a bit about the markets, actually, and the financial markets with our business correspondent, Theo Leggett, and how they've been responding to this uh, extraordinary day of politics. And of course, the, the markets have been instrumental in a way in the demise of Liz Truss. It all began with their reaction uh, to, to the controversial mini budget of last, last month. Absolutely, Ben. And there's a delicious irony here, really, that um, the markets which triggered 
this acute bout of political turmoil, this political crisis, have taken the departure of Liz Truss pretty much in their stride. Uh, we did see a spike in the value of the pound just before her announcement was made. Um, it went above the $1.13. And the government's cost of borrowing has come down a bit as well. But it's been a relatively muted reaction. And I think the, there's a very good reason for that, which is that whoever comes into power as successor to Liz Truss will be hamstrung. They will not be able to come in with the kind of almost revolutionary policies that she came in with. She came in and the first thing she did was announce a sweeping energy subsidy program. That had an open-ended cost. It was extremely expensive and it was open-ended for two years. Then off the back of that, she introduced the mini budget or her chancellor introduced the mini budget, which included some 45 billion pounds worth of unfunded tax cuts. Now we've had U-turns on both of those. The energy subsidies will still be in place because frankly they are needed, um, but they will only continue until April and then there will be a review. Um, most of the tax arrangements as we know have been overturned. So. The things that really upset international investors to begin with have kind of been dealt with through those U-turns and there's unlikely to be a U-turn on the U-turns. We won't see a prime minister coming in and promising sweeping tax cuts. That just simply isn't going to happen. The question is, what happens now in the fiscal statement on the 31st of October? And the new prime minister will be coming in just three days before that statement is made. And we also know from what people within Westminster have been telling us over the past week, um, that there are still disagreements within the Conservative Party over just what should happen in that statement, where the cuts will fall, for example, because there will need to be spending cuts. And it's interesting to note that the uh, CBI, the business lobby, has come out and said, stability is key. The next Prime Minister will need to act to restore confidence from day one. They'll need to deliver a credible fiscal plan for the medium term as soon as possible. And it's that word credible that others have been repeating as well. Whoever the new Prime Minister is when they come in, they will have to deliver a set of policies that work for investors, that work for the markets and also that work politically as well. Theo, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Theo Leggett there, our business correspondent. Uh, let's gauge political reaction now from right around the United Kingdom. In a moment, we're going to be talking to our correspondent, Hal Griffith, who's in Cardiff, and Chris Page in Belfast. Let's first of all, though, go to James Shaw, who's in Glasgow. And, and James, we've had a pretty ferocious reaction to, uh, to, to Liz Truss's resignation statement from the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. That's right. She said there are no words, Ben, to describe this utter shambles adequately. It is beyond hyperbole and parody. Reality, uh, though, is that ordinary people are paying the price. The interests of the Tory party should concern no one right now. A general election is now a democratic imperative. There have also been responses from the other political parties as well. So Douglas Ross, who is the leader of the Tories in Scotland, he says we must now move forward quickly and the new leader and prime minister will have to restore stability for the good of the country. Anna Sawa, who's the leader of Scottish Labour, we need a general election now. Alex Cole Hamilton of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, the Conservatives are not fit for government, also calling for a general election. And Patrick Harvey, who's the joint leader of the Scottish Greens, Never in the field of British politics was so much harm done to so many in so few weeks. So misquoting Winston Churchill or reversioning that famous quote uh, from Winston Churchill about the Battle of Britain to characterise uh, his view of what Liz Truss's administration has done uh, in the last six weeks uh, or so. So I think the general consensus outside the Conservative Party in Scotland, it is very clear, Ben, that consensus is for a general election as soon as possible, but it seems highly unlikely that that call is going to be answered anytime soon. Uh, James, thank you very much indeed. I just want to bring uh, viewers some uh, news that the Times newspaper is reporting that Boris Johnson is expected to stand in the uh, Tory leadership contest that we're going to have. This is from Steve Swinford. Uh, who's the Times political editor, saying, I'm told that Boris Johnson is expected to stand in the Tory leadership contest. He is taking soundings, but is said to believe it is a matter of national interest. And if that were true, that would be extraordinary, uh, having been forced out of Downing Street just a few months ago uh, after that whole slew of resignations 
that began with Rishi Sunak uh, leaving office and then Boris Johnson after many, many of his ministers uh, resigned, being forced himself to resign. And of course, that then paved the way for that leadership contest that we saw over the summer between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, that Liz Truss won. And now Liz Truss herself is out of Downing Street. Um, she served 44 days so far. She will stay on as prime minister for the time being until there is uh, a new Tory party leader, which is expected to be by October the 28th. But Boris Johnson, according to The Times, is expected to stand in the Tory leadership contest. We'll be uh, getting reaction to that from uh, the Tory party and uh, many other people as well. And uh, trying to find out from Boris Johnson himself if that is true. Uh, now, let's go back to uh, the uh, reaction right around the United Kingdom. We were hearing there from uh, James in Glasgow. Let's go to Hal Griffith, who's... Uh, got reaction from Wales, and we've been hearing from the First Minister, haven't we? Yeah, and a pretty scathing uh, response from the First Minister, Mark Drakeford. Not a surprise, maybe, when you remember that he's the leader of the Welsh Labour Party, but certainly not someone with any sympathy for Liz Truss. In a statement, he says there's been a complete and utter failure of government with everyone in the country now to pay the price. The complete lack of leadership is preventing decisions and action being taken. Now, you have to remember that in 44 days as Prime Minister, Liz Truss didn't even speak to Mark Drakeford. Normally, Prime Minister would speak to First Minister, something we saw um, on and off with Boris Johnson during the pandemic. But uh, we know that there wasn't even a phone call between the two. So Mark Drakeford may now have to prepare himself for speaking to a new Prime Minister. But who will that be? Were it to be, as, as the news you just broke there, Boris Johnson to stand, I think some Welsh Conservatives may like that because in the 2019, uh, well, Boris Johnson helped to win uh, a record equaling number of seats in Wales, 14 Tory seats. The polls at the moment suggest that most of the blue would be wiped off the map in Wales. So Tory members here in Wales and the Senate members and the MPs may back that Boris bid if it is confirmed. In terms of the other parties, well, Ply, Ply Cymru scathing as well, joining calls for general election, really making the case that the Westminster chaos, as they call it, is probably an argument for Welsh independence. Eventually, the Liberal Democrats in Wales here too, um, condemning the actions of Liz Truss's dying government. So um, very little sympathy, it seems here, for Liz Truss after she's announced her resignation. Hal, thank you very much. And to Chris Page, uh, who's in Belfast for us. Chris, uh, reaction there to the drama that we've seen unfolding in Downing Street today? Yes, well, there's now a whole new level of uncertainty, as if any were needed here in Northern Ireland. It's been said in recent days that Westminster had ceased to have a functioning government. Well, Northern Ireland has been without a fully functioning devolved government since February. That was when the Democratic Unionist Party, in effect, collapsed the power-sharing Stormont executive over its opposition to the Brexit trade border with the rest of the UK, known as the Northern Ireland Protocol. And the DUP says it won't allow power-sharing to resume unless checks on goods arriving here from the rest of the UK are scrapped. Sir Graham Brady mentioned Friday, next Friday, the 20th of October, as the day whenever the Tory leadership uh, contest could be con uh, should be concluded. That is also uh, a day marked in the diary in this part of the UK. That is because it is on that day, next Friday, that the legal deadline to restore the devolved government after the election in May runs out. And the current Northern Ireland Secretary, Chris Heaton-Harris, has made clear, really just in the last couple of days, that he will go ahead and call a new election to the Stormont Assembly if there is no political breakthrough. So parties here had been preparing to go back to the polls on the 15th of December. So now lots of questions about that. If it does take until next Friday for the new Prime Minister uh, to be in place, 
Well, you would think that would mean there'd be no time for uh, the Westminster government to change course on calling an election, if indeed they had the legal means to do so. If it was concluded a little bit earlier, well, could you get a new Northern Ireland secretary with different ideas to Chris Heaton-Harris, who could find some sort of legal mechanism for delaying that Assembly election? So far, we've had the Cross Community Alliance Party and uh, the Nationalist SDLP calling for a general election, never mind an Assembly election. Also, I've just heard from the woman who is in line to be First Minister at Stormont if power sharing is reduced, Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill. She said the chaos and disastrous policies of the Tories have heaped misery onto workers, families and businesses. Liz Truss joins the long line of British Prime Ministers who have failed people here and she says all parties need to work together and support the people in a new Stormont executive. As for the DUP, well, they had been fans of Liz Truss during the Tory leadership contest, thinking she would take a firmer line with Brussels in the uh, negotiations over the Northern Ireland Protocol. But now they uh, will be attacked by other parties for having supported Liz Truss, in essence, up to this point. OK, Chris, thank you very much. Chris Page for us there in Belfast. Also, thanks to Hal Griffith in uh, Cardiff and James Shaw. Uh, with reaction from Glasgow as well. And we can go uh, to Glasgow as well to join the uh, Professor Sir John Curtis of the University of Strathclyde, uh, our well-known expert in British political history and all things political. And I, I want to... Your starter for 10, John Curtis. Does this make Liz Shaw the shortest-serving Prime Minister in British political history? Not quite. George Canning has that prize because... Um, he died while he was in office. But, um, yeah, for somebody who's still alive, at least this is the shortest running term. It's a good it's a good pub quiz question. And at least I now know the answer. Thank you very much. Um, right. What do you make, first of all, about what happens next in terms of this Tory leadership contest? Is it likely to go, do you think, to the wider membership? Can it be done within a few days, within a week? Well, I think that's probably a technological question, which is beyond my uh, ken, as it were, in the sense that, you know, if MPs can whittle the uh, uh, number of candidates down to two by, let's say, Tuesday, whether the Conservative Party has the ability to run an effective online ballot within a matter of a couple of days. And that's probably the question that some of the party officials are currently trying to work out. But that's pretty much clearly pretty much the only way of doing it. And that obviously raises the question that, you know, well, there'll be some Conservative members who don't necessarily have access to the internet or at least not very familiar with it. It is a relatively um, older uh, section of the population. So far as the candidate is concerned, well, you've already talked about uh, Boris Johnson trying to stand. I think we should remember at this point that Mr Johnson still has hanging over him the inquiry by the Committee on Standards as to whether or not he misled the House of Commons uh, with regard to his, some of his statements about Partygate. And I would have thought, but maybe I'll be wrong, that Tory MPs might be very wary of jumping back into having Mr Johnson in office and then finding themselves embroiled in exactly the same arguments about his probity from which they thought they had escaped when he was brought down at the beginning of July. If so if we do in the end reckon that Mr Johnson perhaps isn't going to be a, a credible runner, then I think you know it's going to be between Mr Sunak, uh, Penny Mordaunt and Suella Braverman. I think she made it pretty clear yesterday that she would run. My guess is, given how she performed first time around, that Suella Braverman is the one that will fall out. Um, and then the question is, can Rishi Sunak second time around win against Penny Mordaunt? And Penny Morden will be a formidable uh, competition because she is, as others have pointed out, somebody who appeals partly to the centre of the party who might otherwise be backing Mr Sunak and uh, part, as well as perhaps also being the one that uh, the Trussites, many of whom will, will be unhappy about what's happened, uh, might be willing to switch to. But of course, doubtless Mr Sunak will be wanting to remind Tory members and Tory MPs in the course of the next few days that he did warn them that this is exactly what would happen. And he will obviously be hoping that having been made it clear about that during the last leadership contest, that he might now get rewarded for what he has said at least second time around. Whoever it is, John, um, given the chaos and the meltdown that we have seen in the last few, well, months and weeks and days, um, how much damage do you think all of this has done to the Conservative Party electorally? So, in other words, whoever it is... Could they win the next election whenever it is? I think the advice has to be to whoever 
does become the next leader is probably to enjoy the next 18 months to two years, because that is probably the length of your tenure. And it is, by the way, probably going to be pretty difficult because you're going to be leading a fractious party, uh, which is not necessarily going to make your life very easy. And I think that's going to be true, whoever gets it. Um, the truth is, um, uh, parties and governments that preside over a fiscal crisis have nearly always struggled at the ballot box at the subsequent election. Uh, the Labour Party after 1948, uh, the Labour Party after 1967, Labour after 1976, the Conservatives after Black Wednesday of 1992, and the Labour Party after the financial crisis of 2008. All of these governments did not remain in office for very long thereafter. And I suspect that's probably going to be the fate of this government. But of course, many an individual Tory MP will be hoping that the party at least recovers from being as much as 30 points behind in the polls, which is where they're at at the moment, because if that were to be a result of a general election, the majority of Tory MPs would be out on their ear. Uh, and just a quick question. Uh, Keir Starmer and others have been saying there has to be a general election now. And there is a question about the democratic legitimacy that, uh, of the new Tory leader, the new prime minister, as we move for further forward away from the last general election. Well, um, it is right that this is the first time since the Parliament of 1935 to 1945, which of course was extended because of the Second World War, uh, where we've had uh, more than one change of prime minister within the Parliament. And before that, you have to go back uh, to the middle of the 19th century. So certainly this is a novel experience. But in the end, we do have a parliamentary democracy. And so long as somebody can maintain the confidence of the House of Commons, then uh, they will be able to avoid a general election. I think that the big question facing the Conservative Party is, will it be possible for whoever succeeds Liz Truss to be able to maintain the Commons of the House of Commons, or will the divisions inside the Conservative Party be so great that we eventually discover that there isn't anybody in the current parliament who can maintain the confidence of the House, in which case we might be precipitated into an early general election. That certainly has to be the back of, uh, the back of Tory MPs' minds as they try to work out who they're going to back and under what conditions. Sir John Curtis, thank you as ever for your uh, unique political analysis. It's good to talk to You're you. Well. Thank you very much indeed. Well, the time is three o'clock and welcome to viewers uh, in the UK and around the world. The British Prime Minister Liz Truss has resigned in a very short statement in Downing Street. She admitted she could no longer deliver the mandate that she was elected on only last month. Her decision followed a meeting with the senior Conservative Party backbench MP Sir Graham Brady amid an atmosphere of exasperation amongst fellow Conservative MPs. Now, the Conservatives will hold a leadership election to replace Liz Truss within the next week, producing what will be the third British Prime Minister since the summer. The Labour Party has called for an immediate general election. Liz Truss's 44 days in office so far have been marked by some of the most dramatic scenes in post-war British politics, and she does become the UK's shortest serving Prime Minister. Although, as John Curtis was just telling us, George Canning did die in office. Um, she blamed turbulent economic conditions for the trouble her government has faced. I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent and our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise though Given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister 
until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. Liz Truss with that very dramatic resignation uh, statement. Just outside number 10 Downing Street. I just want to correct myself, actually, um, in terms of who has been the shortest serving British Prime Minister. It is Liz Truss, we are now told, because although we were hearing from some Sir John Curtis that it was George Canning um, who uh, died in April in, in 1827, he had served 118 days uh, as Prime Minister. Liz Truss, uh, well, 44 days so far, and uh, by the time she is... Uh, replaced by the new Tory leader. Once uh, he or she is elected, it will be probably something like 50 days. Anyway, let us hear now from Sir Graham Brady, who is uh, chair of the 1922 committee. He says he expects uh, a leadership result by Friday of next week. He's been taking... Do you accept that this is, do you accept that this is a complete dog's dinner? It's, um, it, it's certainly not a circumstance I would wish to see. So, Graham, will you have to make the threshold for nominations really high in order to flush out candidates? You just can't waste time on this now, can you? I, I think these are uh, details that will be clear later on. Uh, I don't, haven't got any more details to share with you now, but there will be some clarity later this afternoon. And how disappointed here. are you? Just, just one more question. How disappointed are you in this? This is the fourth, third Prime Minister in four months. The public must be looking at this thinking, what on earth is going on? This is the governing party. Absolutely. And and they are uh, absolutely. And I, I think we are deeply conscious uh, of the imperative in the national interest of resolving this uh, clearly. And quickly. So there will not just be a general election, Sir Graham. There will not just be a general election. How can uh, you continue to uh, keep clearly, fighting the next election? Clearly, isn't the matter. Uh, isn't the matter for me. Will there definitely be two candidates going forward to the membership? Uh, the uh, party rules say there will be two candidates unless there is only one candidate. So if somebody uh, drops out, if somebody uh, drops out, it could only be one. If there is only one candidate, there is only one candidate. Uh, Do you expect uh, that, that to happen? I, I really can't give you any that, more detail. Whose idea, Sir oh, Graham, was it to have this contest truncated to one week? Was it Liz Truss's idea or was it your proposal? I, I, think, uh, I think it's a, a, a matter on which there is a pretty broad consensus. Why and is that because of you. the Tommy Fraser Trust? So that was Sir Graham Brady, and he was saying that uh, there will be a new Tory leader, he expects, by October the 28th. That's just before um, the Chancellor, um, and we don't know whether that will still be Jeremy Hunt, delivers the government's fiscal statement on October the 31st. So Sir Graham Brady expects there to be a new Conservative leader and a new Prime Minister uh, by October the 28th. But as we were just hearing there, he isn't sure whether it will be two candidates, whether it might just end up as one candidate. If it is two candidates, it looks likely to go uh, back to the wider Tory party membership and how quickly that can be organised technically in terms of some sort of online, online voting, we will have to wait and see. In the meantime, we've also been getting reaction from the Labour Party leader, Sir Keir Starmer, who's demanded an immediate general election and he's been giving his reaction to the news from Downing Street that Liz Truss is resigning as Tory party leader. Well, what a mess. And this is not just a soap opera at the top of the Tory party. It's doing huge damage to our economy and to the reputation of our country. And the public are paying with higher prices, with higher mortgages. So we can't have a revolving door of chaos. We can't have another experiment at the top of the Tory party. There is an alternative, and that's a stable Labour government and the public are entitled to have their say, and that's why there should be a general election. Some sympathy for Liz Truss, her time in office, pretty humiliating. The damage that has been inflicted on the public through higher prices and mortgages is considerable. This is not a soap opera. These are real lives that are being impacted by the mess at the top of the Tory party. We've had this revolving door. We've had these experiments at the top of the Tory party. The public are entitled to choose between this utter chaos um, and a Labour party which will stabilise the economy and have got a clear plan for growth, for living standards and for jobs of the future. We need a general election so the public can make their mind up about this utter chaos. Isn't there an argument that a general election might actually prolong the instability to an outcome of that general election? Do we need more instability now or just a chance for a clean state and just to stabilise the ship? The risk at the moment is continuing with this chaos. 
not having a stable Labour government. So that's why there should be a general election. We can't just allow the Tory party to keep putting up the next candidate in the middle of this chaos. There is a choice. There's a Labour Party that's capable of you know, stabilising the economy, has a clear plan, um, and the public entitled to choose between that stable Labour government and this utter chaos of the Conservatives. Are you ready for government? This is not the context you would have wanted to take over. We are ready to form a government to stabilise the economy and implement a real plan for growth, for living standards, to help people through a cost of living crisis. And that's the choice now, a stable Labour government or this utter chaos from the Conservatives. Brilliant, thanks. So that was the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer. Let's go back to our chief political correspondent, Nick Erdley, who's uh, in Downing Street. He was there as the Prime Minister came out. Uh, with what will go down in history as one of the most extraordinary uh, resignation statements of a British Prime Minister. And, and, of course, all eyes now on who might succeed her. And, Nick, intriguing uh, reports that Boris Johnson could be throwing his hat into the ring. We're hearing that from The Times, uh, not confirmed at all at the moment. Yeah, not confirmed by us just yet, Ben. We have asked some of Boris Johnson's allies. I'm told that he is being encouraged by a number of MPs to do so. One of his key allies, Sir James Dudridge, who was his PPS, one of his um, key, uh, key aides in, in Downing Street, basically the person who helped Boris Johnson uh, negotiate with Parliament, he has said that Boris should, Johnson should come back for the good of the country. Um, will it happen? Quite possibly. Uh, the, the Times, Steve Swinford is very well connected. Um, I, I think there is one potential stumbling block there, though, which is MPs. I'm not all that sure that a lot of MPs would want to be seen to be going back to an old leader, even if Boris Johnson did decide to come back from his holiday in the Caribbean and stand for leader. I, I think it would be tricky for him to persuade enough MPs that he was the right man. I've spoken to some of the people who were his allies in Downing Street um, just before he stood down as well. And some of them have said they, they're not all that sure that politically he can recover from some of the scandals over the last few months. But said it an hour ago, I'll say it again, nothing surprises me around here anymore, Ben, so who knows? Rishi Sunak, his allies are gearing up for him to stand. We've not heard from the former chancellor yet either, but I, I'd, I'd suggest as a fairly decent chance of him standing, given that he came second to Liz Truss, came quite close to Liz Truss, actually, in that leadership contest. And then we have all these other names doing the rounds already. Let me name you a few of them. Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary. Kemi Badenoch, who stood last time. Penny Mordaunt, who stood last time. The one person who's not going to stand is Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor. Got a lot on his plate. He has to come up with a fiscal plan for the 31st of October, a proper budget to try and plug the fiscal black hole. But look, stand back from it a bit, Ben. What a crisis. This is a genuine political crisis of unprecedented scale, where the country is facing a massive economic challenge. The Prime Minister's been in for five weeks and decided she's not up to the job and she can't deliver what she promised. We're going to get a new Prime Minister within a week. They're going to have three or four days to negotiate with the Chancellor ahead of that budget, and then they're going to try and have to get the economy back on track and then restore some political stability to the highest office in the land. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary moment. Uh, yeah, it certainly is, Nick. And I was just talking to Sir John Curtis, really, about how much damage all of this has done to the Conservative Party electorally whenever there is an election. And, of course, Keir Starmer wants one right now. It doesn't seem very likely he's going to get it. But um, whoever is the new leader of the Tory party, they've got a huge challenge economically, uh, but also politically, to try to win back the trust of the British people. Totally, Ben. And the calls for a general election are going to get louder and louder and louder. Excuse me looking at my phone, but this is moving very quickly. So a couple of things. Just had a text from a friend of Boris Johnson saying they doubt that he'll stand, but they reckon you love the speculation. Let's see. Our political editor, Chris Mason, is saying that sources close to Brandon Lewis say that MPs are urging him to stand now. He is, of course, the... Uh, what is he now? The Justice Secretary. He was the Northern Ireland Secretary. He's now the Justice Secretary. has been for five weeks since Liz Truss 
took over. So what's really intriguing is at the moment, and we, we hinted at this earlier, at the moment it feels like a bit of a free-for-all with loads of MPs saying, well, yes, maybe, maybe this person, maybe that person. A lot of people seem to be taking soundings to figuring out if they want to stand. At the moment, it looks like it could be a large field. However, watch what happens this evening. It, when, if we get any more details on the rules from Sir Graham Brady, my sense is that MPs will want to get this done as quickly as possible. I reckon they'll want to make the decision themselves, although we'll wait and see if they, if they make that call. And that could mean this moves quite quickly and the thresholds to get through various rounds are actually quite high to make sure that there is a new Prime Minister in place in this address by this time next week. Yeah, Nick, um, of course, look at your phone at any time you want. Um, I won't take it as, a, as an insult at all. I know you've got uh, the news to keep up with um, as you get messages from uh, important political sources. Um, but, but, but just um, on the terms of the rules then, that is going to be crucial, isn't it, that threshold? Because, I mean, not to be rude to potential contenders, but they will want to weed out fringe candidates who aren't going to attract very much support in order to keep this contest as short as possible, just a few days. I think that's absolutely right. I think there is absolutely no doubt that that's the case. MPs in the Conservative Party that I've been chatting to over the last few days are mortified, some of them, by what's going on at the moment. They feel humiliated by the turmoil in their party. And to be honest, some of them have given up. They don't think that there's going to be a recovery. But those who are still fighting are determined to get this done as soon as possible. The calculation that was being made this morning before Graham Brady turned up here and had that conversation that led to Liz Truss's resignation, the conversations I was having with Conservative MPs were weighing up the question of whether it would avoid chaos to get Liz Truss out or create more chaos. And the hope I think most conser all Conservative MPs will have now is that if they move swiftly, get someone else into place, have a new Prime Minister within the next few days and don't allow this to become a free-for-all with loads of candidates, they might be able to get someone in who can work on their credibility and that stability and that authority right away. I still think it's going to be extremely challenging. The turmoil in here is going to be really hard for, to recover from. It's going to be very hard for the new Prime Minister, whoever they may be, to wipe the slate clean in a week's time, not least because they're going to be dealing with the economic decisions that have been made in here over the past five weeks of the Liz Trust Premiership. However, this is something that is being actively discussed among Conservative MPs this afternoon. Remember, we keep talking about them because they are going to make the big decisions over the next few days. They may well decide over the next few weeks who lives in here. Uh, Nick, I'm going to leave you for a moment. You can check your phone uh, all you like and you go and find out whatever you can and come back to us very soon with more uh, important information. Uh, that's Nick Eardley there, our chief political correspondent. And let's also go back now to Anita McVeigh, my colleague who's in Westminster as well. Anita. Ben, thank you very much. And uh, with me here is the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davey. And we spoke, uh, thank you very much for joining me, first of all. We spoke a couple of days ago when there was speculation that Liz Truss uh, certainly could survive as PM, potentially until the end of October, when the Chancellor would uh, deliver more detail on the government's fiscal plans. But she's gone. Your reaction to that news and the fact that we're going to have a new Conservative Party leader, a new Prime Minister, by next Friday. Well, Liz Truss trashed the British economy with her unfunded tax cuts. Before her, Boris Johnson failed our country with his dishonesty and law-breaking. Um, the Tories have shown that they're incapable of providing the leadership. They're not fit to govern our country. We don't need another Conservative Prime Minister. They need to go. Uh, we need another general election. And Conservative MPs have got to do their patriotic duty and vote for that. Yet there is no mechanism, is there? to lead to a general election at this point. So what's the strategy for the Lib Dems? Well, we call on Conservative MPs to do their patriotic duty. If they fail to do that, I think their constituents will note. I think there is a big movement in the country for a general election. And Liberal Democrats want to put forward our positive uh, agenda. You know, we called uh, over a year ago for a windfall tax on the oil and gas companies so we could fund responsibly the help for people with their energy bills. And if they'd follow that uh, policy, we wouldn't be in the mess now. Mortgage rates wouldn't be as high as they are now. So Liberal Democrats want the chance to put our 
positive policies to the British people and we want these Conservatives out of government. Uh, what's your reaction to that speculation in the Times that uh, Boris Johnson is taking soundings about whether he should throw his hat in the ring? Well, we don't want any Conservative Prime Minister. We want an election. And Boris Johnson, uh, I can't believe he's even going to put himself forward. There's still an inquiry into whether he misled Parliament. And the whole British people knows that he was dishonest, didn't follow his own rules, broke the law. Uh, it could be quite outrageous if Conservative MPs allowed him back. Uh, on who else might sa stand, we're hearing from The Telegraph. It's reporting that Rishi Sunak is certain to stand for the leadership, according to uh, close allies, senior MP allies of the former Chancellor. You know, there's a bit of a sliding doors rationale for him, isn't there? He can come along and say, well, look, I told you this is what would happen if uh, Liz Truss was elected and she tried to implement these economic policies. Uh, we are personally at the BBC trying to confirm this with Rishi Sunak, but The Telegraph's reporting he is certain to stand. So he's going to say to MPs, look, you should have listened to me. We wouldn't be in this position. So how, how strong is his, is his chance of becoming the next leader, do you think? Well, his record is poor, as is all the Conservatives. We need them out. They're the ones who caused this mess. Uh, Rishi Sunak's policies were disastrous. They failed to give people the help for their energy bills. Uh, they didn't tackle inflation um, and they didn't produce growth. So wherever you look amongst the Conservative Party, they don't have the people to help people who are struggling but, with their mortgage bills. But he wasn't, going for the, he wasn't going for the tax cutting policies that, that Liz Truss was, was he? Well, he wasn't helping people with their energy bills. And frankly, uh, there's such a divided party. Many people really dislike Rishi Sunak because of what he did to Boris Johnson. They're fighting each other. Our country needs stability. We need a political party in the government that can give strong leadership. The political instability, the divide, divide a party, which is the Conservative Party, isn't fit to govern our country. They have to go. Uh, and, you know, just moving uh, the deck chairs on the Titanic with one failed Conservative uh, MP after another isn't what our country needs. We're in a real mess. It's a huge challenge. Millions of people are struggling, struggling families, struggling pensioners. They need help. And with this political instability and divided Conservative Party, they're not going to get it from this long. You're a political leader when you look at the polls in which the Conservatives have been performing so badly. Uh, you must be chomping at the bit to get to a general election. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. Uh, Keir Starmer also calling for a general election, clearly, and the SNP and other political parties. Uh, what do you do in the meantime to try to, you know, keep the faith with those who've already voted for you? to reach out to potential new voters and, and to try to take this situation and say, look, vote differently next time. Well, beyond arguing the case for a general election so we can get rid of the Conservatives, Liberal Democrats will continue to put forward our constructive policies. A year ago, we put forward the windfall tax to raise the money in a responsible way to help people. Uh, I led on that debate. Others then followed. Liberal Democrats led on the idea of giving support for people on the energy bills. We were the first party to argue to freeze the cap on energy prices and other people followed the Liberal Democrat lead. We will continue to come up with the policies that our country needs, whether it's on the economy to deal with the cost of living crisis or on the NHS and social care where there's a crisis with our public services on their knees. So we're determined to listen to our constituents. Uh, at a community level, we're, we've got great representation and to build on the successes we've had over the last 12 months where we beat the Conservatives in three by-elections in their, in their heartlands and in the local elections last May across the whole UK, Liberal Democrats did better than any other political party. So we're ready, we're, we're beginning to, I think, attract support to us because we have those sensible policies. Sir Ed Davey, leader of the Liberal Democrats, thank you very much for your time. Uh, yes, so just to recap on that news that uh, The Telegraph is reporting that uh, Rishi Sunak is certain to stand, is the quote, according to The Telegraph, uh, who've been speaking to senior MP allies of the former Chancellor. Uh, we believe he's in his constituency in North Yorkshire. Uh, he has been keeping a pretty low profile in recent days and weeks, hasn't he? But, you know, during that election campaign, when it got down to him and Liz Truss as the final two candidates to be the next party leader and prime minister, he said that if Liz Truss was elected and implemented her economic policies, well, he pretty much predicted 
what has happened in terms of market reaction to her tax cutting plans. Uh, so Rishi Sunak certain to stand, according to The Telegraph. We are here at the BBC trying to confirm that. But uh, with me now, right now, with her reaction is uh, Carla Denier, the co-leader of the Green Party. Carla, thank you very much for joining us here on BBC News today. And like I've been asking all the other politicians I've been speaking to, first of all, your reaction to the events of the last couple of hours. Well, the events of the last couple of hours, weeks, months, you could say years, has demonstrated that the Conservative Party are unfit to govern. The chaos they've created through their ideological uh, movements by trust in her mini budget, the, the untold harm that's caused to the economy. And let's not forget the harm that it's caused to people in their everyday lives. People were already struggling from the cost of living crisis. And now there's more and more uncertainty. People are really living in fear about what it means for them. We cannot allow the Conservative government to, yet again, a very small pool of people choosing who runs this country from an increasingly small pool of uh, people with the talents to do so. so. So you're basically saying the Conservatives had their chance to try to create a fresh start when they chose Liz Truss. That hasn't worked out yet. Um, there isn't a mechanism, is there, for a general election to be called. Um, it, it's within the gift of the Conservative Party. It doesn't look like the Conservative Party, their MPs are going to, to vote for that to happen or say that should happen when the party is doing so badly in the polls. Yeah, I recognise, of course, that we're in a parliamentary democracy and so it is not constitutionally required to change uh, to have a general election when they have a change of, of the leader of government. However, it is very clear that the Conservative Party have lost the trust of the vast majority of the public. Um, they've really lost the authority to govern nationally and internationally. And now with Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor, he's clearly laying the groundwork for bringing in a second round of austerity, which will be massively harmful you know, I'm, I'm a local councillor in Bristol. I've been a councillor since 2015. And so I've seen firsthand the horrendous impacts of the first round of austerity on government spending, including local government spending, and it really hampering the ability of um, local government to provide essential services to people that are struggling, even services like preventing homelessness. And yet, with no electoral mandate whatsoever, Jeremy Hunt is trying to bring in another round of damaging austerity. He's got. He's simply not got the votes to, to back up those policies. Yeah, he, he has said that public spending will rise overall, but of course there's been no commitment has there to uh, that rising in line with inflation, which would be a cut in real terms, just to explain to our viewers. But uh, same question I put to Ed Davey a couple of minutes ago. Uh, as a political party, you know, were the conditions such that there was a general election as a possibility, you would be chomping at the bit to get out there and campaign. So, But with that looking unlikely, it seems, What's your strategy now? Well, yes, we are ready for a general election and we had our party conference just a couple of weeks ago, a few days before the Conservatives, and the contrast couldn't be more stark. The mood in the Green Party conference, uh, a journalist reporting from there described it as calm. It was really focused uh, and we're all really pulling in the same direction. We've got a fantastic set of policies, including some more that were adopted at that conference, and we're re really raring to go to get more Greens elected in Parliament, because wh whichever party is in government, if we can get a few more Green MPs in Parliament, we can pull that government in the right direction, keep them on the straight and narrow, and make sure they're passing policies that bring us towards a fairer and greener country. Carla, thank you very much. Carla Denier, uh, co-leader of the Green Party. Well, uh, it's going to end up as a question in quizzes, isn't it? Uh, which Prime Minister had the shortest time in office. That is uh, Liz Truss, the rather ignominious, uh, certainly not an honour, ignominious title uh, that uh, she would have now. Uh, 44 days in office. She's going to be there for one more week uh, until a new leader is appointed by next Friday, the 28th. Um, quite a dizzying speed of events. Someone who can put all of this in a much greater context is Anthony Selden, the historian, who joins me now. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And uh, I hope you're not going to correct me. I am right in saying that she is the shortest serving prime minister. Uh, she is indeed. So Canning was uh, 119 days, but he died, so he couldn't have done very much uh, about that. And you say you're trying to put it in some kind of context. I'm not certain I can. I mean, it's uh, all the records are just 
collapsing before our eyes. This is extraordinary. Yeah, um, that's been reflected by other people I've spoken to today, that there really isn't any sort of precedent for this sort of thing. So um, what does this say to the UK, to the rest of the world, about the functioning of Parliament here, the mother of Parliaments just across the road from where we are standing? What does it say about how it functions and how the parties within the system here function? Well, people all around the world look to Parliament. Uh, so many copied Parliament in one form or other. And so many copied the office of Prime Minister, uh, which is the longest surviving office anywhere, leader's office anywhere in the modern world. Uh, 301 years. We're now on to our 57th Prime Minister, 57 varieties indeed of Prime Minister. And I think it's showing them uh, that uh, the country that should be the most grown up and mature, uh, that has given its system of government um, across the world, is making a total hash of it at the moment. Uh, 57 Prime Ministers, but the turnover rate in just the last few years has been remarkably yeah. fast, hasn't it, all yeah. Conservative Prime Ministers in the last five, six years? Yeah, we've never seen this before. I mean, you, in, the, in the Premiership League of football, you expect a rapid churn in the Premiership League, but you don't in the League of Premiers expect such rapid churn. And we have never seen that before in Prime Ministers uh, since uh, the 1832 Reform Act uh, which created our modern democracy. And when you combine that with the churn of Chancellors of the Exchequer, their second Lord of the Treasury, uh, and also Home Secretaries, this is a fundamental weakness. Now, none of this means that the country can't uh, recover. Uh, and in Jeremy Hunt, uh, there is one grown-up, uh, sensible figure who's earned trust across uh, the spectrum and markets. Uh, if he can, uh, and the like of him can be there, uh, then it can stabilize the country economically and financially. Politically, uh, it does look like a, a very bleak future for the Tories if they can hold the general election off indeed for two years, and if it's not uh, uh, going to be coming even sooner. Yeah, I mean, he has just, if he is still Chancellor when the new leader is appointed, he has just a few days then with that new leader potentially before he delivers his fiscal statement, his budget on the 31st of October. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very short period. You want, you want to come well, in I there? Mean, just let's get this clear. You have to have stability in a democracy. You have to know who people are, who's the Prime Minister, who's the Chancellor, who's the Home Secretary overseeing the security These big uh, of, of, of the whole country. Uh, because the markets, uh, foreign powers, uh, look to this country uh, and they form a, a, a jaundiced view. We've just lost uh, the most recognised, loved, uh, known figure in the world in Her Majesty the Queen. That's another element of instability. Uh, and we have the possibility of strikes and, and NHSQs uh, and fuel bills uh, and great uncertainty coming up. Uh, it needs uh, people to stop playing at politics and recognise what a very serious business this is. These records, history does matter. Uh, it matters that you have stability and you're never going to get a, a sizable round of cuts through, public expenditure cuts through, unless a Prime Minister commands confidence around that cabinet table. So very rapidly uh, there needs to be a new Prime Minister who is a grown-up, who does inspire confidence and who recognises that you can't just suddenly rush in. Margaret Thatcher, uh, she was very careful. She had her own majority when she came in in 1979, but she still took two years before acting against the trade unions, learning that her predecessor, Ted Heath, uh, had made a muddle by rushing in. It requires you know, a, a, a serious outbreak of wisdom. Uh, that's what we need. Uh, and, and it requires, it sounds as though you're saying, the Conservative Party, all of its members, to take a step back and get over their differences in, in the interests of stability. That's going to be a pretty tall order, isn't it? Because there has been uh, a lot of fractiousness in the discussion, in the debate, within the Conservatives, hasn't there? Are they capable of it, one wonders? I mean, the, the, there are some who get it, but... You know, they're there to serve, uh, not to serve their own narrow tribal interests, but to serve the country at what is becoming, uh, if it's not already, a significant 
crisis, um, moving towards uh, the, the major crises we've had in the past of Suez in 1956, the IMF crisis in 1976, Black Wednesday in 1992. There are elements of all those in this, uh, and this could get uh, even worse unless somebody, for goodness sake, gets a grip soon. Anthony, uh, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time today. The historian uh, Anthony Selden there. Um, we'll have more reaction for you uh, here on College Green very soon. But right now, it's back to the studio. Anita, let's just uh, bring you a little bit more on uh, the possibility that Boris Johnson could stand in the leadership uh, contest. The Times are certainly reporting that they are quoting sources close to... Uh, Boris Johnson is saying that he believes it's a matter of the national interest, that soundings are being taken, would be an extraordinary development, just uh, a matter of weeks actually after he finally left Downing Street, that uh, he could conceivably return there. But uh, we've got some word from our political editor, Chris Mason, on that speculation. Um, and Chris Mason says that uh, those around Boris Johnson are not, are not knocking these stories down. A source telling our political editor... Uh, he is not saying anything either way at the moment. So it's, uh, it's being reported by The Times, but it hasn't been clarified or confirmed at all that Boris Johnson is going to run in this leadership race. So we will have to watch this space. Uh, we've also had a statement from the US President Joe Biden about the resignation announced today of Liz Truss. And I'll just tell you what Joe Biden has been uh, saying um, uh, that the US and the UK are strong allies and enduring friends. That fact will never change. I thank Prime Minister Liz Truss for her partnership on a range of issues, including holding Russia accountable for its war against Ukraine. We will continue our close cooperation, says Joe Biden, with the UK government as we work together to meet the global challenges that our nations face. So that is a statement just in from Joe Biden reacting to the news that... Uh, Liz Truss is stepping down as Tory party leader and will be gone as UK Prime Minister in just a few days' time once um, a successor is elected by the Conservative Party. Who's that going to be? Uh, the runners and riders will no doubt emerge very soon. But let's uh, go to our correspondent, Duncan Kennedy, who's in Winchester getting some reaction from voters who must be, Duncan, pretty surprised at today's turn of events. Well, maybe not surprised. <laughs> some are, some aren't. Over the, over the short time we've been here, Ben, we've got various reactions on that. We'll find out a couple uh, in a second, a couple of people we've, we've got here to speak to. Let me just tell you about the constituency that we're in. It is Winchester, and it's one of the more marginal seats in the country, currently held by the Conservatives in the form of Steve Bryan, who's got a majority of 985, so very marginal here. It tends to flip-flop in the last few years between the Conservatives and the Liberal Dems, but at the moment it's held marginally by Steve Bryant. It's also a very busy town, busy city this afternoon uh, because there's a graduation ceremony going on at the local university. And two people who've stopped by to talk to us are Tim and Ibusha, who are here for the day. Can, as Ben just asked me there, let me ask you, what's your reaction to Liz Truss going, first of all? Oh, it's very good news. Uh, that woman was trying to destroy the country with these mad policies and at last the Tories have uh, seen sense and pushed her out. You voted various parties down the years. Um, Liz, what's your reaction to Liz Truss going? I'm just, you know, hooray. I think it's, you know, well past time. I thought she was absolutely appalling. Were you surprised she went? Uh, um, no, not really, because it's been sort of coming for a few, uh, a few days now, I think. She's just kept hanging on there. And we thought, we'd, you know, she'd never go. We've been chatting here for the last few minutes. You've got a few ideas as to what should come next. A general election, please. Simple as that. <laughs> yes. Tim? Absolutely a general election. Uh, that's the only thing. You can't keep putting in another Prime Minister, the Tories, you know, electing among themselves. Let's just assume they are for the moment, for the purposes of the next week or so. Whose names, whose candidates are popping up in your mind? Uh, anyone except for Boris Johnson. Uh, so I guess... Rishi Sunak has at least got a brain on him, which is more than you could be said for Liz Truss. We've got the Times newspaper reporting in the past few minutes that Boris is standing, but no confirmation from anybody. W would Boris be one for you, Liz? No, it'd be a dis disaster. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's under investigation still. I don't see how he could possibly even stand. 
If not Boris, give us a name each. Rishi Sunak, maybe. Gove? I don't know. I think Gove might be a bit of a dark horse in here. You know, <laughs> he's, he's been very quiet and he's quite an operator. But actually a general election is what's needed for the country. Tim and Buser, thank you very much indeed. Just a couple of voices from a very big city with a lot of people in it. The kinds of voices I suspect, Ben, that the candidates who do stand in the next week or so will be hearing a lot more of. Duncan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, immediate reaction there from Winchester. Good to see you. Now, uh, we've been hearing from the Conservative MP Mark Garnier, who says there should be a general election in reasonably short order and that the public would be rightly furious if it were unnecessarily delayed. He's been speaking to BBC Radio Hereford and Worcester, uh, and he started off by saying how damaging he thought Liz Truss's time in office has been for the country and indeed for his party. It's been simply breathtakingly damaging. It is, uh, it is absolutely astonishing. The, uh, if you think we were, with, with Boris when he left, we were, I don't know, five or six points behind in the opinion polls. I think the latest one is, has its minus 36, which is, which is astonishing. If we had an election tomorrow, there would not be a single Conservative Member of Parliament left. And, and bear in mind, this is, politics is a tough game, but the Conservative Party is, is um, the most successful political party there has ever been in the history of politics in the world. It's, it, is, it has been an astonishing successful, and she has done an immense amount of damage, damage to it. And you just said it there, didn't you, really, that if you were to have um, a general election tomorrow, there wouldn't be a Conservative MP left. Now, as we heard with our political reporter there, James, um, we didn't get to choose the last one. We didn't, we're not going to get to choose this one as a voting nation. Um, morally... Why shouldn't there be a general election? So, Isn't it time? So, so, yeah, yeah. So, 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 look, I completely agree. The, the, um, at the end of the day, the, the, the Constitution doesn't require it, but your, your point about it being morally or ethically, you know, kind of what, what would be the right thing to do. Um, so, so I was asked about this earlier this week, and I, uh, and I basically sort of said I agree with the principle that we should test the new Prime Minister reason, reasonably short order, um, rather than wait potentially until January 2025. I think people would be furious, rightly furious, what I would say, though, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat that comment with a really important point, which is that um, it would be a very unhealthy general election if you were to have a uh, one of the major protagonists, in, 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 in particular the government, the, the party that's in government at the time, being in complete disarray, because democracy requires there to be viable choices. If if we, you know, for example, had a general election today with no leader, it wouldn't really be a viable choice. So I, so I think. You know, what we would probably ask is a bit of time to get our, our ourselves into into general election order, and then and then go to the country. Because I, I completely agree with you. I think I think people will be rightly furious if if um if we delay this unnecessarily before having a general election. That's the view of one Conservative MP. Just a bit of reaction to that uh, report in the Times newspaper this afternoon that Boris Johnson is considering standing of being one of the contenders for the Tory leadership race. Uh, to replace Liz Truss, which would be an extraordinary development if, uh, uh, considering the fact he only left Downing Street um, a matter of uh, weeks ago. And uh, the Deputy Liberal Democrat leader, Daisy Cooper, has said he should be barred from competing in the Tory leadership contest. Uh, and quoting uh, Daisy Cooper, she said, the fact that Conservative MPs are even considering putting Boris Johnson back in number 10 shows how out of touch they really are. Boris Johnson was forced to resign in disgrace. He shattered public trust in the government. He must never be allowed near Downing Street again. That is the view of the Liberal Democrats. We haven't yet had it confirmed that Boris Johnson is uh, in contention for the leadership again. Uh, we are hearing that he is taking soundings. Uh, let's get more now from Anita McVeigh at Westminster. Yes, Ben, thank you. We're, we are just hearing that news as uh, well about Mark Garnier, the Conservative MP, saying uh, that he wants to see an election soon. With me, Jonathan Ashworth, Labour's uh, Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, and looking pleasantly surprised at that statement from Mark Garnier, Jonathan. Yes, I agree with Mark Garnier. It's pretty clear to me that the Conservatives have no mandate to stay in government. The crisis of soaring mortgage rates, the run on pension funds, is an economic crisis which was designed and manufactured in Downing Street and Tory MPs cannot stitch it up and enforce on the country another Tory Prime Minister and cut the public out. 
We need a general election now. But are you surprised to hear a Conservative MP say that? And I wonder, do you think he might be an outlier? Because with the polls the way they are, surely the majority of Conservative MPs wouldn't want an election. Oh, well, I think Mark Garnier is... I didn't hear the interview, but I suspect he probably agrees that it's utterly abhorrent that we could have another Tory Prime Minister forced upon us and the public are denied any say in that whatsoever. We need a general election because this government, this Conservative government after 12 years, have got no mandate. They've given us economic crisis and people have had enough. People have really had enough. And we need a government that will stabilise the economy, clear up this economic mess and rebuild our public services. So I think when Mark can probably, probably sense, like I do, that people have had enough, and that's why we need a general election. How are you going to clear up what you call the economic mess with many of the global conditions that the current government is facing still in place, continuing to be in place for some time, the war in Ukraine, well, chief there, amongst those? Well, there is a global backdrop, that is true, which is why it was so disastrous of the Conservatives to pour petrol on that fire, if you like, with that, that kamikaze budget, which led to a run on pension funds, a spike in borrowing costs and soaring mortgage rates. Look, we would always be prudent and we would never be reckless with the public finances. So we would bring stability and certainty back to the economy. But we'd also begin to rebuild our public services and we'll take measures to help stabilise the cost of living crisis as well. Uh, Jonathan Ashworth, I'm just going to interrupt our interview uh, right now because as we look at these pictures of Downing Street, so much has happened there in the last couple of hours. Uh, we're going to say goodbye just now and thanks for watching to our viewers on BBC One.